the audience without Michael. Thank you, Ted. Um, so first I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining you from the lands of the Woiwurrung and Boomerang people of the Eastern Kulin Nations and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Um, and indeed, as we discuss queer struggle and oppression today, I want to express solidarity with the First Nations people of the world and the deep knowledge embedded in First Nations cultures. Um, as Ted mentioned, I'm Dr. Drew Pettifer. I have the honour of introducing someone who really needs no introduction. So the Honourable Michael Kirby, ACCMG, is an eminent international jurist and educator, having been one of the longest serving judicial officers in Australian history. Uh, he retired from the High Court uh, in, nine, in 2009 after 13 years on the bench, twice having served as acting chief justice. He was the first openly gay person to sit on the court. And prior to his appointment to the High Court, his roles, which stretch back to the 1970s, included in, uh, positions like Deputy President of the Australian Conciliation Arbitration Commission, uh, Inaugural Chairperson of the Australian Law Reform Commission, Judge of the Federal Court of Australia, President of the New South Wales Court of Appeal, President of the Court of Appeals of the Solomon Islands, and after his retirement um, from the bench, he served on many international and UN bodies, um, remaining particularly active. These have included uh, being a member of the Eminent Persons Group of the Commonwealth of Nations uh, from 2010 to 11, Commissioner of the UNDP Global Commission on HIV and the Law from 2011 to 12, Chairperson of the UN Commission of Inquiry on North Korea from 2013 to 14, for which he was awarded the Order of the Rising Sun, Gold and Silver Star from the Japanese Emperor in 2017, member of the UN Secretary General's High Level Panel on Access to Essential Healthcare from 2015 to 16, and since 2018 he's been co-chair of the International Bar Association Human Rights Institute. Uh, he has many, many awards including the Australian Human Rights Medal, the International Gruber Justice Prize, and was the winner of the inaugural Australian Privacy Medal among many, many others. I could go on, but um, I want to 
end by saying that Michael has a profound commitment to education, uh, having served on governing bodies of many universities, uh, including nine years as Chancellor of Macquarie University. He's an honorary professor at 12 universities in Australia and overseas, and has numerous honorary doctorates. Um, and we're very lucky to have him speak to us today at the University of Western Australia. Uh, his interests, according to his website, before I hand over to Michael, uh, include HIV AIDS and the global right to health, LGBTIQ, animal welfare, the arts and good causes. Can we please welcome Michael Kirby? Thank you very much, uh, Drew. And uh, thank you uh, also to, um, the, uh, to Ted Snell and to the others at the University of Western Australia uh, who have made it possible for us to establish this link across our continental country uh, and to uh, talk about thinking queerly. Um, I, uh, like Drew Pettifer, acknowledge the Indigenous people of our land scattered all over the uh, continental landmass of Australia uh, and in Tasmania. Uh, and uh, like Drew, I feel uh, a link with the Indigenous people in that, uh, though small in number and a minority uh, which has been subjected to uh, legal uh, rules that have been oppressive and unjust, um, we are beginning to see uh, improvement and change. And it is the duty of all uh, intelligent uh, people, all rational people in Australia, to move in the direction of change. Um, I also want to pay a special tribute to the University of Western Australia. I first came to the University of Western Australia in 1966, um, when I was uh, participating uh, as a student troublemaker in the National Union of Australian University Students. Uh, they had an annual meeting which was scattered around the country. And uh, in that year, the meeting was in uh, Perth at the University of Western Australia. And I gathered there with some friends from UWA, um, Rob Holmes Accord, um, his future wife, Janet, uh, Daryl Williams, later the Federal Attorney General, uh, and uh, others, uh, and uh, we uh, joined in what was for me the last meeting of NUAUS that I was attending. I can't recall to mind any of the um, actual debates that we, we went through at that meeting, but I can recall a wonderful um, opportunity that was presented to me unexpectedly when uh, I discovered that in the Winthrop Hall, there was a performance of the St. John Passion of J.S. Bach being um, uh, prepared um, because our meeting coincided roughly with Easter. And uh, I uh, was not familiar with the St. John or the St. Matthew Passion or indeed with much of J.S. Bach's music. And so when I look back on that time, it is a spiritual thing and a thing of the mind and the spirit, the music of Bach that I remember from my visit to uh, UWA at that time. Uh, and uh, I will always be grateful for the encounter, encounter, that, encounter, that, encounter that, that was organized for me to enjoy um, J.S. Bach's wonderful music. And so on this occasion, we are coming together in a similar spiritual, emotional and intellectual quest uh, that I hope will be memorable for us all as we uh, contemplate the reasons for and the cures of uh, thinking and acting queerly and make sure that uh, people coming along today don't have the same uh, difficult journey that many of those who are older have. Um, subsequently, in my judicial life, I came to Perth 
virtually every year with sittings of the High Court of Australia, and I would come out to UWA, and later um, I um, uh, would attend meetings of student uh, bodies uh, with, where I felt at home, that being the way in which I had spent most of my time in uh, university at the University of Sydney. But one thing was very different, uh, and it was the experience of coming to the entrance uh, of uh, the University of Western Australia and seeing a flag flying that I had never seen at any other university, and indeed I couldn't remember seeing at any uh, non-gay events. Um, and this was the rainbow flag. And the rainbow flag was proudly flying as I, a justice of the High Court of Australia, was entering into the uh, grounds of the University of Western Australia. And I'll never forget uh, the sense of emotion that I felt when I came through uh, the uh, entrance and saw the rainbow flag and I thought, well, I wouldn't have seen that back in 1966. And the person who was responsible for the flying of the rainbow flag is Alan Robson. Alan Robson was the vice chancellor of the University of Western Australia from 2004 to 2012. So his period of service overlapped with my own service on the High Court of Australia. And I understand that Alan Robson is present at this occasion today. Uh, now, Alan Robson has a wife, uh, children, grandchildren, and he's absolutely overwhelmed with heterosexuality. But under his leadership, the University of Western Australia became the first university in our in country, 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 country that country. flew the rainbow flag. And uh, I want to thank him for taking that initiative. And I want to thank him for his leadership in doing so. It probably lifted the spirits of many young LGBTIQ people at University of Western Australia. <clears throat> it certainly lifted my spirits uh, so much so that uh, when I came through, I asked the driver to go around and go through the gate entrance again, because I wanted to see it and uh, blink and make sure that I wasn't having apparitions. But there was no apparition. Uh, the flag was there. And I know from other universities in Australia where I have ever so gently suggested that they should fly the rainbow flag uh, as Alan Robson had done at the University of Western Australia, it isn't hard to get bureaucrats, or rather it is hard to get bureaucrats to take a sort of step that is new, uh, and, uh, but it wasn't hard for Alan to do that and uh, it was a great uh, initiative some universities have actually refused to fly the flag, though there is a, a, a flagpole ready for it, but um, it will happen and it will happen because of leadership of people like Alan Robson. So I want to pay a tribute to him and express my thanks. Um, what uh, I wash, want to talk about today is why it is that there has been in our country, still is in some uh, parts of our country and some parts of life in Australia, uh, and certainly is uh, there in abundance in many countries, um, uh, such an enormous hostility towards LGBTIQ people. Why is this so? What is it that um, causes this animosity. And it's that um, which I think brings us together to talk about thinking queerly and what it is about thinking and acting queerly uh, that causes such animosity and hostility. Let there be no doubt that there's a lot of animosity and hostility and 
the exhibition which is being displayed at the Lawrence Wilson Art Gallery um, of uh, the wreck of the Zeid Zeivag uh, in 17, uh, 1727 uh, is uh, a very vivid uh, tale, um, both of the dangers of travel at that time, but of the special danger of uh, people who were caught uh, engaging in uh, gay sex. Um, now, the wreck of the Zeevake uh, is famous for many things, um, uh, not least uh, the uh, wreck, the, the circumstances that led to the uh, change of course of the vessel uh, that brought it into collision with some of the uh, reefs that uh, scattered along the coast of Western Australia. But uh, there's a special angle to the story of the Zeebake, uh, and that is uh, the uh, discovery um, in the interval between the shipwreck uh, and uh, the departure of the longboat for Batavia, now Jakarta, uh, that ultimately led to the rescue of the party on uh, the mainland uh, in Australia, when it was discovered that two young men, they're called boys in some of the stories, but one was 18 and one was uh, 22. So they were really young men uh, who had been caught uh, having uh, sex uh, and uh, they were uh, tried, uh, convicted, sentenced to death, and ordered to be marooned on separate islands off the coast of Western Australia, uh, near Gun Island, where the major party of the uh, of the uh, shipwreck uh, were gathered. Um, these two young men. Um, were not heard of after they were placed uh, on the island. And the net result was that we must assume that they uh, perished. Um, and uh, that would not have been difficult in the circumstances um, of um, isolation and lack of food and lack of water. Uh, but this was not a completely isolated event. Uh, as Drew Pettifer has pointed out, um, on the previous year uh, in the middle of the Atlantic, um, a, uh, a, another sailor who had been convicted of the offense of sodomy was marooned on the isle on Ascension Island. Uh, and he had the bad manners to leave a diary and the diary uh, told of his deprivations and suffering uh, that followed uh, his being left isolated uh, on Ascension Island. Um, sadly, his diary is full of reproach uh, for uh, his dastardly crime, uh, which, uh, in the nature of things was not uh, the most serious uh, offence uh, that one could imagine, but it was regarded as abominable and so abominable that the crime could not even be uh, described or mentioned amongst civilised people. That's what Blackstone, the legal writer, wrote of it. And so, um, uh, for uh, their uh, acts, which today would be of a relatively insignificant um, uh, and indeed uh, unimportant character, uh, these three young people uh, from uh, the Netherlands, or what is what was then uh, the United Netherlands States, uh, were marooned and left to die. You've got to have an awful lot of hatred 
of people to inflict that sort of punishment on another human being and just to leave them effectively in the middle of nowhere. But the interesting point that Drew Pettifer makes is that, um, in fact, this may well be the first trial, certainly the first trial in the Netherlands um, lexicon and uh, before any trial was conducted by the British on the mainland of Australia uh, that was conducted and it was conducted for an anti-homosexual offence that was part of the laws of the Netherlands uh, as then existing. And that uh, is a, a good reason why we should reflect upon uh, the uh, the crimes uh, that were um, prosecuted against uh, the young men uh, and uh, the terrible punishment that was inflicted upon them. The British Empire um, left the legacy uh, of the sodomy offence in all of the territories where the Union Jack ever flew. Uh, in fact, uh, it had three codes, criminal codes, for the purpose of stating what the criminal law would be in all British territories. Um, those codes were uh, developed by three very fine uh, lawyers, Thomas Babington Macaulay, uh, James Fitzjames Stephen, and Samuel Griffith. Samuel Griffith was the first Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia, having earlier been, before Federation, the Chief Justice and earlier still the Premier uh, of the colony of Queensland. But he wrote uh, a great criminal code, uh, which uh, is in force to this day in Western Australia uh, and in Queensland uh, and substantially uh, in the Northern Territory. Um, in other parts of Australia, the common law or a mixture of the statute and common law um, uh, are in place uh, in lieu of a code. But in Western Australia, um, the uh, state uh, adopted the uh, Griffith Code. And like the, ba the Macaulay Code and the Stephen Code, it contained a provision um, imposing extremely severe punishment for sodomy. Um, and uh, that punishment originally was the punishment of death, uh, just as had been imposed on the young sailors uh, who were in the service of the uh, East India Company. But uh, the, the penalty of death was subsequently changed uh, to uh, extremely long periods of imprisonment. And that was the uh, penal code of Western Australia that was in force for most uh, of the last century. Um, towards the end of that century, steps were taken to try to get rid of the uh, criminal offence against uh, homosexual sexual conduct uh, in private uh, and between adults. And a statute was introduced in 1989 called the Law Reform Decriminalization of Sodomy Act of uh, 1989. And that law was introduced into the Parliament of Western Australia. Uh, and it provided that changes would be made to the provisions that Sir Samuel Griffith had um, bequeathed to the good people of Queensland, Western Australia and uh, the Northern Territory, rather similar to the statutory provisions uh, in other states of Australia, including New South Wales, where I studied law. But there was a particularly nasty provision in the Western Australian reform statute. It's not very often you see a really nasty provision in a reform statute. 
if they want to be nasty, they simply don't enact the statute. But in Western Australia, they enacted the statute, but the representatives of the people of Western Australia in 1989, so we're not talking of a long time back, this is 30 years back, uh, they enacted the following provision through the lower and upper house of the Parliament of Western Australia. Quote, whereas the Parliament does not believe that sexual acts between consenting adults in private ought to be regulated by the criminal law. So far, so good. And whereas the Parliament disapproves of sexual relations between persons of the same sex, and whereas the Parliament disapproves of the promotion or encouragement of homosexual behaviour, and whereas the Parliament does not by its act in removing any criminal penalty for sexual acts in private between persons of the same sex, wish to create a change in community attitude to homosexual behaviour. And whereas in particular, the parliament disapproves of persons with care, supervision or authority over young persons, urging them to adopt homosexuality as a lifestyle and disapproves of instrumentalities of the state so doing. And then there are the provisions for the reform uh, of the criminal code, deleting the criminal punishment for homosexual acts. Rarely must a parliament have had such a sense of legislative indigestion when it uh, presented a bill for enactment that it uh, expressed so many times over its extreme distaste for what it was doing, it's indeed its reluctance to be doing it and its concern that doing it might be misunderstood. This was something being done uh, very, very reluctantly. And that was the provision by which uh, in Western Australia, the law was changed in 1989. Now my visit to the University of Western Australia um, in uh, the 1990s uh, and then in the first decade of the uh, new century uh, was uh, the time when I saw the rainbow flag flying at the University of Western Australia. So that goes to show how very close to the enactment of this horrible legislation was the action of the uh, council uh, and uh, the uh, vice chancellor of the University of Western Australia to fly the rainbow flag anyway, and to send out its signals uh, for those who were entering into its space. Uh, so uh, that was the law that was originally enacted in Western Australia, uh, and it took a long time for further laws to be enacted that have changed things in WA and in other parts of Australia. Uh, in fact, the changes that occurred uh, began in none of the English speaking countries, they began in France. Uh, in 1793, a meeting of the Estates General during the time of the French Revolution uh, decided that it would repeal the old royal provisions in the criminal law of royal uh, France uh, that impose penalties on uh, the crime of sodomy. Uh, and uh, that led uh, to um, a change in the French penal code, which was introduced by Napoleon in 1810 which Napoleon rightly said would probably last a whole lot longer than his um, battles uh, and victories. Uh, the penal code of France um, profoundly influenced the criminal laws of Germany and uh, many other European states. Through them, 
uh, it influenced greatly the penal law of imperial and post-imperial Russia. Uh, and uh, through that, it influenced the laws of China and Japan and many countries of Asia. And so in many of the countries of our world that were not blessed with British rule, they didn't have the provisions similar to those in the Griffith Code, uh, the Macaulay Code, uh, and the statutes that were enacted for the British Empire. Uh, they just didn't have those laws. But everywhere the Union Jack flew, they got the criminal law against uh, homosexual conduct. Uh, this led to movements in England originally to get rid of those laws. Those movements were originally propounded by Jeremy Bentham uh, in 1820 and followed up by J.S. Mill, uh, but um, it was a slow process, slow indeed. Eventually, um, uh, something happened, uh, and this was considerably before uh, Stonewall. Young people think everything has to happen in America, and that's the only way in which cultural change is achieved. But sometimes things can happen elsewhere, and so it was in the case uh, of the sodomy offence and uh, the criminal law against gays. Uh, in 1948, um, a very important um, researcher, uh, Alfred Kinsey, began his research into the sexual conduct of the human male. Kinsey had been uh, an expert in bees. His great expertise uh, was um, uh, as a zoologist, as they were called in those days. And that uh, uh, is what led him to examine the conduct of human beings uh, and that led to his two great books, uh, Sexual Behaviour in the Human Male and Sexual Behaviour in the Human Female, 1948-53. At the time I first laid my hands on those books, I was um, aged um, nine in the case of the first book and um, and uh, 14 in the case of the second book. Uh, you can take it from me that it got a lot of headlines in uh, the Daily Mirror and the other uh, press in Australia at the time because it was so shocking that somebody was actually researching and talking about sex. But the, the Kinsey reports and the subsequent work of Dr. Kinsey and of Evelyn Hooker, a great um, sexologist, led ultimately to steps in the United Kingdom Parliament for the reform of uh, the criminal law. And the pathway to those steps was a royal commission. Uh, sometimes good things come out of royal commissions. And this was the Wolfenden Royal Commission of 1956. Uh, chaired by Sir John Wolfenden, who was a vice chancellor. I would think he was probably a vice chancellor uh, of uh, the like of Alan Robson, because he uh, was dedicated to science and he just gathered the scientific uh, evidence and said the criminalization of homosexuals is just fundamentally wrong in principle and wrong in effect and should be repealed. And that led in 1967 in the United Kingdom, uh, well before Stonewall, to the Sexual Offences Act of 1967. And that act uh, was the forerunner for the reforms of the law uh, in relation to uh, criminal laws in Australia. Um, most of the jurisdictions of Australia, uh, though not Western Australia, as I have told you, or Queensland, which had a preamble rather similar to the Western Australian, not quite as offensive as the Western Australian, but it, it was of the same spirit, uh, 
but in other parts of Australia, they simply repeal the old law. And so in the United Kingdom, and then in Canada, and then in South Australia in 1974, and then in New Zealand in 1986, uh, and then in other parts of Australia, and finally in Tasmania in 1997, uh, the old sodomy law was repealed. And that was a precondition to getting uh, less hostility uh, and less opprobrium that was evident in the, uh, in the statutory provisions that accompanied the change uh, in the first instance in Western Australia. Uh, since that time, uh, the struggle uh, in Australia uh, and in other countries has been to follow through the logic of the step of removing the criminalization uh, of uh, homosexuality and homosexual acts. And the, then secondly, to uh, provide anti-discrimination laws to prevent discrimination against people on the grounds of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Uh, and then um, steps that were taken to secure the recognition of personal relationships of LGBTIQ people. Those steps were another uh, difficult, painful, and needlessly protracted journey. Um, some of them were achieved substantially by court decisions, <clears throat> as the decision in the United States to recognize marriage equality in the Supreme Court's Obergefell decision uh, achieved that. Uh, in other jurisdictions, such as Australia, the Republic of Ireland, uh, and elsewhere, uh, it was achieved by statutory provisions, but not without a real fight uh, and uh, obstacles placed in the way. The uh, journey has by no means concluded. Uh, in many uh, of the countries of the Commonwealth of Nations, uh, which have inherited uh, a criminal code from uh, Macaulay or Stephen or Samuel Griffith. The Griffith Code, by the way, is in force in Nigeria. They opted to chose to, um, to follow the uh, Samuel Griffith Code. And it's also in force in, um, uh, in uh, Ghana. So uh, those codes are still applicable and in some places, there is very little change. Uh, change has been achieved substantially by court decisions applying their Bill of Rights, their constitutional provisions. Uh, and this is the case uh, in the great decision of 2018 in Johar against the Union of India, which uh, struck down uh, the uh, Indian Penal Code, Section 377. And that uh, has led to a, a series of cases that have sought to introduce similar reforms, sometimes successful, uh, but sometimes, as in Singapore, Uganda, Kenya, and Zambia, unsuccessful. Uh, and so the battle and the struggle goes on. And so the final question that I want to leave uh, with this audience in reflecting upon thinking queerly is why has this happened? Why did it last so long? Why was the battle and the struggle so protracted? Why were otherwise kindly and good and decent people guilty of language such as appeared in the Law Reform Decriminalization of Sodomy Act 1989 of WA. 
why was this so? Well, of course, a partial explanation is that the roots can be traced back to religious texts and specifically to provisions in the case uh, of uh, Judaism, of Islam uh, and of Christianity um, in the book of Genesis and in the book of Leviticus. Uh, and uh, at least the interpretation that some have put on that is that God has commanded hate uh, and death for uh, LBG, LGBT people. Um, no one until quite recently paused to ask why God would have such an animosity to people who have simply followed their own nature and why that would be so when what appears in nature ordinarily has a good reason or a reason for it. But whatever the reason, the fundamental lesson that these criminal laws were designed to instill in people was a hatred of difference, a hatred of uh, the rule of variation that Charles Darwin taught was essential to the evolution of species. And the rule of variation in respect of sexual orientation and gender identity was something so intolerable that it couldn't even be mentioned. It was abominable. And the way in which it was placed was by inflicting upon people a feeling that they were unworthy, a feeling that they had broken God's commandment uh, and that they must therefore suffer and above all they must pretend that they were otherwise than they were. And this is uh, the, um, the approach <coughs> that is now uh, falling apart <coughs> as increasing research along the lines of Kinsey, Hooker and other scientists have shown that sexual orientation and gender identity are not binary but are on a scale and within that scale there are divergencies and this is just an aspect of natural variation and if you've got a problem with it you should take an aspirin and get over your problem and not inflict uh, self-hate and denigration upon people who are LGBTIQ. Looking at the events in Australia at the moment um, and uh, at the events concerning human sexuality, um, I saw today that the former Senator Corey Bernardi has asked whether or not <clears throat> there is um, uh, going to be an investigation by federal parliament into the sexual sexuality of LGBT people. Why pick on straight people only? Uh, and this is all part of the attitude of, uh, of dislike, distaste, and objection to difference. It affects indigenous people, it affects women for being different, it affects people of different races, it affects people uh, of uh, various disabilities or attributes, uh, and uh, it is contrary to the human rights, and, rights, and, rights, and rights, it is the duty of all civilized people to change it, and that is what we should do when we think queerly. Thank you so much, Michael. That was really fantastic to listen to. Um, we have about 25 minutes for, for discussion now. So um, I might start with a few questions for you, if you don't mind, then we can open up to the, to the floor. Um, 
you covered a lot of terrain there. So I think I might start with thinking about how you mentioned how sodomy was illegal until 1989 in Western Australia and in many other Australian states until the 80s and even 90s. It does feel like we've come a long way in the last 30 years, but I'm just thinking many of those early changes were about removing criminalization, which could be said to be quite a low bar in terms of legal change. I'm wondering if you can elaborate on your reflections on the legal changes that have occurred over the past few decades and where that might leave us in terms of um, the pathway towards equality. And you're currently on mute. The changes uh, had to start with criminalization because whilst you had criminal laws, it was very difficult to make progress with anti-discrimination laws or relationship recognition or uh, adoption uh, by people uh, who are LGBTIQ or all the other changes um, that uh, were necessary. For example, the big obstacle that existed during my judicial service in making a provision for my long-term partner, Johan van Floten, uh, to enjoy the Judicial Pensions Act benefits. Um, that was something which during the 1990s, when my old friend Daryl Williams from NUAUS time was the federal attorney general, um, uh, the proposition was put up that that those sections of the act should be changed to permit um, a um, same sex couple to enjoy the same benefits uh, as uh, opposite sex spouses and later opposite sex de facto spouses. Those reforms had been changed, uh, but um, Darrell Williams didn't agree with that he said that is not government policy. And then when he was replaced by Attorney General Ruddock, uh, Attorney General Ruddock said, this is not government policy and it won't be changed. Change, 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 change. It, was, it was in fact changed uh, in the first two weeks of the Rudd government, 120 pieces of federal legislation were uh, changed by legislation that was introduced into the federal parliament by the new government and the opposition then led by Brendan Nelson supported the changes. So I was left wondering, well, why did they, why did they um, present such an obstacle if it could so suddenly within the space of the election period and two weeks uh, changed to no opposition. So, um, but it was necessary to change the criminal law first. Uh, Neville Rann, the Premier of New South Wales, didn't think it was absolutely necessary and he enacted anti-discrimination law that forbade various forms of discrimination on the grounds of sexuality, but they were in place at the same time as the criminal law provided for the punishment of people for same-sex, adult, private, consensual activity. So there was, a, there was a disparity between what the criminal law was saying and what the anti-discrimination law was saying. But fundamentally, you had to get rid of the criminal law. And uh, we shouldn't think that issue is over in the world it's not over in most of the countries of the Commonwealth of Nations, they still have the same horrible old laws that we had. Um, they haven't even, maybe we should export to them the uh, preamble that was used in the Queensland legislation, if that would make them feel better uh, so that they could enact uh, the uh, legislation uh, but under protest. But um, you see, the clue to the objection is expressed in that preambular statement, which says, um, and whereas in, in particular, the parliament disapproves of persons with care 
supervision or authority over young persons, urging them to adopt homosexuality as a lifestyle. Uh, the contention that sexual orientation and gender identity are a lifestyle is such an unscientific statement uh, and uh, it has to be dealt with very firmly, I'm afraid, um, but it still exists. I'm afraid it's something that exists in a lot of religious circles. They will go on referring to uh, homosexuality as a lifestyle. Well, it's not a lifestyle. And, but whilst people were... I've got an echo. There we go. That's better. Whilst people were um, uh, were uh, <clears throat> mesmerised by the the lifestyle, I've even heard very intelligent judges using the word lifestyle. So this wasn't something that um, uh, was only used by ignor ignoramuses. It was used by people who heard in religious circles one's sexual orientation um, uh, uh, used as a, as, a, as a lifestyle, like collecting stamps or something uh, of the same. Anyway, uh, reflecting on the change that has occurred, I think we have to be aware that in the countries of our neighbourhood, um, where there are many countries that still have the criminal law, we have to be of support and help to them uh, in changing the old criminal laws which we donated to them. And this, uh, this is partly done by worthy visits by learned lawyers and uh, social scientists, and not all of them gay by any means, simply rational people. Uh, but it can also be done by uh, thinking queerly and by people being honest and open about their sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. In some countries, it is extremely dangerous to be open and honest about uh, homosexuality or, or transgender status. Uh, and uh, those countries uh, can inflict terrible wounds and punishment on people, people, people who do so. <laughs>
by actually meeting neighbours who are uh, Asian Australians or African Australians or people of different races, different skin colour. Once you meet them, you realise uh, how irrational hatred on the basis of some attribute of nature is. And um, that is how we have made progress in Australia on race. Uh, and it's how we will have to go on making progress on other features of human diversity, including sexual orientation and gender identity. And I think it is a bigger challenge on the issue of uh, gender identity than it is on the uh, basis of uh, sexual orientation, which is more familiar to the public now than is gender identity. That is a big challenge, as President Trump found. Um, Trump was not particularly hostile to gays, but he did some a number of things um, in relation to transgender people uh, in schools and in the military that were hostile. And the way to change that is for people to get to know uh, transgender people and to get to know their journey in life. And knowledge is power and it changes people's attitudes. Mm. That's a really interesting point. I was, I was actually going to ask you whether um, you thought the connection between law and politics and our social experience, for example, um, how that might influence the way change comes about. I'm thinking in particular how law and political will can sometimes trail the thoughts of the people, as you say, once people um, you know, are familiar with, with certain minority groups, they can often lead um, the legal and political positions. I'm thinking, for example, of the many years of polls that showed majority support for marriage equality before we got there in Australia, among many other things. Um, I'm wondering if you have thoughts about those perceived gaps and how the social might interrelate with the legal and the political. I do think it's true that in Australia, we lag behind popular acceptance of change. That seems to have been demonstrated by the marriage equality debates where it was fairly clear for a, a significant time that the majority were quite comfortable over the issue. Um, and that was a reason why my partner, Jan, and I uh, were, uh, were not favourable to the plebiscite because it was interposing on the path of uh, an equality provision in the law, uh, an impediment that had not been interposed in other cases, and uh, we objected to it. My partner, Jan, grew up in the Netherlands under occupation. And he, he, though he was only a little boy at the time, the post-war dialogue in the Netherlands about those who had um, cooperated with the occupying force and those who had not and often paid a price was extremely bitter. We don't, if you're not connected to someone who lived through that experience, you don't really fully know it. But Johan continually said, as an Australian citizen, I object to something being put as a barrier in the path of my equality. And that's why originally we said we would not um, vote, we would not take part in the plebiscite. But eventually um, we uh, changed our minds and thought, well, we, we shouldn't give haters a free kick. And so we, we did vote, um, but it was an it was a, an unfortunate precedent and a bad process, mm -hmm. but it led to a happy outcome. And as you have said, we we got married on exactly 
the 50th anniversary, the day of our meeting, and indeed virtually the hour of our meeting 50 years later. And if you can conceive something, I don't think we were a big threat to anybody. I wonder if you have any uh, questions from the floor at uh, University of Western Australia at the moment. Uh, we'll see if we can open it up and hopefully the technical um, abilities allow that to happen. Do we have questions from people in the audience? No, not at the moment. That's fine. I have plenty more questions for you, Michael, <laughs> to use up the last few minutes we had. Um, I suppose a key question is where you might see future challenges for the um, LGBTIQ plus community, um, particularly in relation to the law and, and social change. Um, you know, I'm wondering whether it might be in the space of conversion therapy or I know that the homosexual advance defence in South Australia is still being repealed or religious exemptions, for example, for anti-discrimination laws, or are there others that, that we need to uh, be aware of as well? Most of these are bits and pieces, uh, and uh, the major battle in relation to um, criminal laws, in relation to uh, anti-discrimination laws, and in relation to relationship recognition, those battles have been fought and won. Uh, but uh, there are other bits and pieces. I, I think if the uh, so-called religious freedom uh, bill, which has been uh, introduced into federal parliament by uh, the federal attorney general, uh, is pursued, uh, then that is going to be a very significant uh, test case, I think. Uh, and it's it's going to be necessary to ensure that we don't permit people in the name of their religious beliefs to reignite animosity and hatred towards LGBT people, trying to force them back into the uh, silence of uh, self-denigration and humiliation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't say that necessarily a problem to solve in the name of religion uh, to um, humiliate people, to allow people to be thrown out of schools or thrown out of um, employment uh, because of their sexual orientation. And, uh, this is this is going to be a test for us, uh, and I I believe we should be quite firm on that test. It's interesting that I think I heard I, the I, Prime I, Minister I, 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 that no one believes that a, a child at a um, religious school should be thrown out of the school because mm. of their sexual orientation or gender identity. I think Mr. Morrison who's got a fairly good weather vane for where public opinion exists on particular issues, as he's demonstrated in the COVID-19 crisis, which I believe he's handled very well. Um, I, I think that if that is his position, well, I welcome that position, but I know that there are some people uh, who want to deny the existence uh, of LGBTIQ children mm -hmm. uh, and who say, well, we don't have anybody at our school who is gay. And that, alas, is because of the hostility that is exhibited towards gay people in many schools of a religious persuasion. Mm -hmm. So somehow there has to be uh, a reconciliation of people's um, right to hold their religious beliefs, but not 
to proclaim them in a way that is going to denigrate and humiliate and take away the freedoms of others. Mm. I once gave a series of lectures in Calcutta and it was uh, called The Right to Swing My Arm. And it goes back to a statement which is often expressed in philosophy that my right to swing my arm finishes when I knock the chin of someone else. And likewise, the right to have one's beliefs and express those beliefs and act on those beliefs uh, reach a limit when they begin to hit the rights of others who are adversely affected by them. And and I think that's what we've got to try to persuade the federal parliament should be the proper approach to uh, the interface of the advance of LGBTIQ rights uh, and the protection uh, in the temple of religious opinion and religious rights. Thank you, Mike. That's a wonderful point to end on, actually. Um... Can I just ask everyone to please thank Michael Kirby for um, such a wonderful and insightful presentation today. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, so we have a two minute changeover for the next panel, I believe. Um, yes, so please I hope I take, stay around. I take the cicadas <laughs> with me. Yes, thank you so much, Michael. Lovely to see you. Thank you very much, Drew. And congratulations uh, on the exhibition and my respects please, to everybody at UWA and particularly uh, to Alan Robson, if he's still there. Thank you, Michael. Wonderful. But thank you all for um, joining me that amazing talk by, by Michael. Um, my understanding is we now have a two minute changeover to the next panel, is that right, Ted? So we'll let everyone set up. Hi. Hi. Maybe I should yeah, mention pass our again. Again. No? Uh, <laughs> My name is Duke, and uh, I'm chairing the first panel today, which is on history and social practice. Is that echo really problematic? Can we fix that? Because I don't like hearing my voice either. Oh, okay. Thank you. My name is Duke, as I mentioned, and I'm chairing the first panel, which is on history and social practice. I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting on Wajak Noongar land, and I'd like to also pay my respects to elders past and present. So today we'll have three very exciting artists talking for five minutes each about their practice, and then we'll open up to questions for about 35 minutes and then we'll take a 45 minute break for lunch at 1.15. But first I'd like to just very briefly say that for me, queerness, whether it's queer acts or identities, uh, they all have a history and even the word queer itself has its own history. For some people, studying history is a way to reclaim forebears and forgotten histories. Uh, painful and tragic or sorrowful as they sometimes are. And for other people, it offers a way to help to understand the present, present circumstances and queer identities through an act of interpretive intertwining of the past and present. Social practice stresses the social embeddedness of our actions, of human activities. Um, so that means that there is a social context to all of our actions so while the two boys who uh, in Drew's art could be condemned 
um, and in history, uh, could be condemned to death for acts of sodomy by leaving them to die on separate islands uh, away from society and from each other, that is to die in utter isolation. Um, their deaths have a kind of history um, and, and origin in social institutions and cultural practices. So I'd like to start by introducing Joe <coughs> Derbyshire, who's our first speaker. Joe is a West Australian painter and social history curator in 2003 while undertaking a Master of Creative Arts in Cultural Heritage at Curtin University. She worked as artist in residence at the WA Museum to create a groundbreaking exhibition called The Gay Museum. And that's a history of lesbian and gay history um, or gay art in Western Australia. And for me, it was one of the queer events of the year. And I still remember it, and that was like 17 years ago. She uses strategies from the visual arts, such as juxtaposition, sound objects, text as a visual tool, together with rigorous research skills, poetry, humour, and a touch of courage to investigate the idea of the absence of evidence in museums and art galleries. And Jo will be talking about her influences and the exhibition at the Gay Museum today. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'd also like to acknowledge the Wajak Noongar people, the custodians of the land, and just to remind everyone here that there are many queer Aboriginal people, and I don't know if there's any here today, but they're often just forgotten um, within our own culture as well. So um, that's just one thing I wanted to say before I started. Um, I feel that, uh, and I can only really talk about my work as an artist in museums today, um, I, I think, I feel that there's a grinding literalism in the way history is presented in general and that gets me down and I think my role as an artist can be to interrupt this way of doing history. Artists are taught that you need to know the rules before you can break them and this is not being disrespectful um, but rather lateral thinking and this allows interventionist work that has roots in both new museology and the visual arts. And this has been particularly valuable for my practice when working with LGBTIQ history. I've been influenced by two artists. Oh, is the work up there, Nick? Sorry. Just the first work, please. First slide. I've been influenced by two artists in particular. Um, who have used juxtaposition as a powerful strategy in their work in museums. Um, the, can everyone see that? Um, the first one is Narelle Jubilin and her work Lost Souls, which is part of her work, it's on the, on the uh, right there, her work at the Museum of Sydney in 1989 and she combined the soles of shoes found in the excavations of the first governor's house with a list of the names of people that had drowned at sea on the early voyages to the new colony. She was the first artist that I came across that unapologetically asked a museum audience to work with metaphor and a play on words. And then on the right, on this side, you can see the work of Joseph Kasu and his 1990 installation at the Brooklyn Museum, which was called The Play of the Unmentionable. And um, he took works from all of the museum's collections and installed them next to a range of wall texts, you can sort of see them there, um, to explore the changing ideas of censorship over time, which as you can imagine, in the 1990s was a loaded theme in, in the USA. And Kasuth also asked the audience to make their own meanings. And, and this was a direct challenge to a literal museum approach. Can I have the next image, Nick? Thanks. Um, so when homosexuality was finally legalised um, in all respects in February 2002, I approached the WA Museum and asked to be an artist in residence, proposing an exhibition that would explore the presence of lesbian and gay 
uh, people in Western Australia. I was originally told by the history curators that I could only use title words to search their digital catalogue to find anything they may have acquired to do with lesbian and gay history. Of course, using this approach, I found nothing. I, like other artists, began to rethink how we had to deal with the absence of evidence in museum collections. I begged them to be able to look at their collections, actually go and physically look at them. And at last, after much fuss and bother, I was allowed to. I wanted to include items from every collection, including natural history. And the dominant um, paradigm narrative at this time was that nature was heterosexual. <laughs> and just to go back to um, the, the, the quote about Kinsey being a bee specialist, I would have loved to know that at the time because this all broke down when one of the scientists actually showed me an example of a gyandromorph bee, which was both male and female. And at that, I at that point I said, well, why can't we show that? And he said, well, it doesn't really fit with the dominant paradigm. <laughs> so the scientists came on board with the Gay Museum quicker than the history curators because they soon realised that this was their chance to talk about some of these differences in, in nature. And that's how I created, the, I, I, I created that exhibition, the Gay Museum, and it became as much an interrogation of the museum as it did an exhibition about lesbian and gay people. Um, can we have the next one, Nick? So museums are reticent to talk about sex, let's face it. Yet for artists, collection objects provide endless material to be used in provocative or poetic ways. These mollusks, for example, enabled me to talk about lesbian sex, and I'd just like to say that's the first time the word lesbian's been used today. <laughs> um, and without any need for words, okay? And my aim in using this image for the cover of the catalogue was to confront the issue head on while making people smile at the same time. And the metaphor cut across cultural as well as sexual boundaries. And for me that was very important. Um, one of the scariest moments of making the Gay Museum was when I was called to meet uh, the late elder Ken Colburn from the museum's Aboriginal Advisory Group who asked specifically to see me. Um, I was so nervous but when we met it was just so that he could say, he could ask me, was the image, can we have the image back, Nick? <laughs> can we have the image back? Yep, sorry. Okay. Yeah. This is hiding lesbian history. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so much closeting. <laughs> Thank you. So it was, he only wanted to see me, and this is a very elderly Aboriginal man, to ask, was the image on the cover really what he thought it was? <laughs> and when I said yes, he laughed, and he said triumphantly, I knew it was, and he'd won some bet or other. <laughs> Can we have the next one? Thanks, Nick. Um, so a museum needs courage, and Ted, I see, has left the room. Um, a museum needs a lot of courage to welcome artists into the museum and allow them curatorial vision, because it is by necessity a critical exercise. Since the Gay Museum, I have not been able to work in this way again, and that's been 17 years ago, until this exhibition at Lawrence Wilson for Here and Now, Perfectly Queer. I had forgotten how challenging it could be. Despite arguing it was conservative curatorial history that I was critiquing, not the individual works, and that the installation would be far more powerful, curious and interesting upside down, um, avoiding the didacticism it currently carries, my proposal was met with resistance by the curators who, who, was, who argued that I was, um, it was a derogatory statement. Arts law had the last word, stating the hanging of the works upside down and the context in which the works would be displayed would be a breach of the artist's moral rights and open, to, and open the university up to possible litigation. I'm very grateful to be able to have the opportunity to have worked with the collections again at UWA, but I'm really sad that um, the, the current compliance culture, a culture which is risk averse, had such an influence on my final work. The idea that meaning is restless 
changeable and political, and I would apply that to sexuality as well. It's very challenging to cultural institutions and continues to be fertile ground for artists like me. Thank you. Thanks, Jo. That was wonderful to go behind the scenes of some of your curatorial practice, especially with the Gay Museum. Our next speaker is Drew Pettifer, who's an artist and non-practicing lawyer, as well as a lecturer in the School of Art at RMIT University. His art practice works across photography, video, print, installation and performance and engages with histories of queerness, photographic theory, archival art practices and social politics. Drew has exhibited widely, nationally and internationally, and his work is held in various collections, including the National Gallery of Victoria, Art Gallery of South Australia, National Gallery of Australia, and the Shepparton Art Museum, as well as private collections. Today, he'll talk about knowledge, archives, and history. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Duke, and thank you also, Joe, for your wonderful um, and thought-provoking talk as well. I'm just going to share my screen um, and hopefully you'll be able to see my PowerPoint. Um, so first, I want to begin by acknowledging again that I'm on the lands of the Woiwurrung and Boomerang people of the Eastern Kulin Nations and pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging um, and recognise the sovereignty is never ceded and also recognize the First Nations people um, where you are joining us from today. So I only have five minutes. So I'm going to offer some high level ideas that we can unpack perhaps further in the discussion. Uh, as Duke said, I'm gonna focus on the construction of queer history and archives in my own practice. So my own interest in um, history, art and social practice sits at this nexus of my own lived experience, um, particularly in relation to um, law and uh, activism and art and social change. Um, and I want to start by thinking about the intersection of queer history in um, our um, Australian historical context. So Australia's colonial history and our archives are constructed in a very unique context defined by discipline, control and surveillance, I would argue. Um, you know, ours is a history under scrutiny, thanks to Australia's colonisation as a convict settlement. So from that perspective, our European history is highly observed and recorded historically. Now, queer histories, on the other hand, um, have often been erased or obscured. Uh, and queerness was, until very recently, um, criminalised, as um, Michael Kirby so eloquently um, pointed out in his um, talk. So there was a risk of attempting to archive or, or keep records. Um, Victorian morality also meant that families uh, who wanted to preserve the memory or character, whatever that might mean, of um, a queer person might hide or obscure those records as well. And so because of these factors, the records that have survived tend to be trials or scandals rather than personal narratives. And it's only in recent years we've been able to reconsider historical narratives like, for example, um, the example here, the relationship between the bush ranger Captain Moonlight and his gang member James Nesbitt. And it's narratives like these that are of particular interest to me and relevant to my practice. Um, without getting too heavy on theory, um, these historical contexts influence how our histories are recorded and recounted. And I find um, the ideas of the French theorist Michel Foucault really influential in my thinking on these questions. Um, so Foucault observed that the construction of histories and archives determine what is able to be seen or what remains unseen. Um, what is said or unsaid during a particular time or context. So um, from this perspective, I like to think that histories and archives are therefore repositories of what it is possible for us to see um, or to say, and what might be left out or blanked out of history and discourse. And so there's a connection here between history and knowledge and power um, in a relationship that is a very political process um, in the way that we record history. And so this is where I find these ideas particularly relevant. And again, we can unpack them further um, in the discussion. Because of these processes, history is always something that I argue eludes us. It's always constructed as a kind of narrative. There's always an element of fiction to it. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, um, in terms of in practice, uh, there's always this gap. And so for that reason, alternative histories are always possible because we need to fill in these gaps. So in terms of dominant histories, um, this is usually done 
according to particular values by a particular culture at a specific point in time or a location. And so I think um, it's a particularly queer act then to construct these resistant histories that challenge these dominant, um, you know, more official uh, histories. Um, and I want to illustrate this by way of a quick example from my own work. So in October 2019, I walked the streets of Ghent and St. Martin's Dyke, um, where the two young men at the centre of my project who were executed in 1727 lived. I followed their footsteps, seeking or searching for a connection to these histories. Um, the two young men I found in the Netherlands and Belgium um, had the same surname and lived in the same towns as the executed sailors. They trace back their own ancestries as well, believe they could be related. But for me, even if they're not actually related in a, any kind of empirical um, sense, they still stand in as effigies. They anchor this history and remind us that this violence was carried out against real bodies and real people. And even if we experience the history ourselves, even if it isn't one that we're looking at a history book for, our memory plays a role in how we recount it. Um, I'm reminded of this excellent quote from David Lynch's movie's Lost Highway. Um, you know, we're effectively we're reminded that histories and memories are contingent and volatile. And so when we don't have a lived experience of event, trying to track it down, understand it, and even see these historical narratives require greater processes of speculation. And um, I'm going to argue that art is a great vehicle um, that is particularly adept at working in this kind of way. And what I've tried to do in um, my project, The Sorrow for Lack, is try to reveal some of those gaps and fissures um, and, and alternatives. Um, I should point out I'm far from the only person to be working in this kind of way. There's a long history of artists working in what might be called archival modes. Um, ever since the 1990s with the archival turn, there's been a whole range of artists. Um, you know, Brendan Hiller Becker, Lorna Simpson, Tom Nicholson, Tacita Dean, Brooke Andrew, Song Dong, um, Walid Rad, and Zoe Leonard, the example here. Um, and these are all artists who were um, interested in archives as interventions into the production of knowledge. Um, and Leonard's work here um, is, you know, a particularly apt pro, um, project where uh, she purported to document the life of a black American actress called Faye Richards from the 1930s. Um, but these are all constructed photographs made in the 90s. Uh, effectively, each of these photographs was meticulously staged for the camera. Uh, and the project actually revealed a portrait of a film career and a life which was sabotaged by racism. Now, although Faye Richards never actually lived, her story is plausible. It stands to address the kinds of erasures in histories of race and class and sexuality in cultural history and more broadly, the history of cinema worldwide. And so what I wanna do in ending this kind of, um, kind of positing of ideas before we open the discussion uh, is to end by suggesting that history only actually comes into being in the present moment in the narratives we tell ourselves about ourselves. And in recounting a history from a particular vantage point, we're recontextualizing this history and doing it in a way that encourages us to rethink our present and perhaps even our future, which is where this work in my exhibition sort of sits in relation to the more historical works as well. Um, it's about contextualizing what is occurring in the present to have us rethink um, our own context through rethinking histories. Um, I'll leave it there. Um, as someone who has not comment and just move on to Peter. Peter Waples Crow is a Narragoo artist living in Melbourne. He's intersecting experiences as an Aboriginal person and his work with community health and art organisations offer him a unique perspective as an artist and community cultural development worker. Peter creates bold, colourful work that explores the representation of Aboriginal people in popular culture, often referencing the dingo as a totemic figure and an analogy for queer outsider mob. In 2019, Peter was awarded the Melbourne LGBTI Community Globe Artist of the Year Award. 
won the 2D Metro Tunnel Prize at the Koori Art Show and was featured in a short documentary called Inside Out that screened in Our Stories on NITV in December. So what Peter and I will do today is we'll have a kind of more conversational style of presentation. And what I'll do is uh, at uh, Peter's request. So what I'll do is I'll start off with a, a question or two and then we'll just dialogue it. Peter, what drives you and your practice in art? And what are some of your influences? Hi Duke, um, and hi everyone. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri and Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung people in Melbourne and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Also my elders in the Narugu community and all the lands that this Zoom is reaching out to. Um, I'm really grounded in community practice and um, oh, uh, I'm just I'm grounded in uh, activism and that's where my art drives from my own personal experience as a Narugu person um, I've I don't know if you're going to show some of the works but um, I look at the intersection of queer and Aboriginal um, yeah in this work the cloak of queer visibility I'm exploring the crash of culture with um, queer pride, uh, and on the back is a cross of erasure. Um, Drew sort of talked about erasure uh, in Western culture, but we've also had erasure in Aboriginal history as well. Uh, our erasure of queerness and pre, and is before colonization, but I often say that we've emerged now as a community um, and we're a really vibrant part of the community now. So. This cloak, as well as being a piece of activism, is also a, a celebration. Um, it's a traditional uh, Aboriginal clothing item um, that was revived here in Victoria and has spread out now across the community. Um, and it, yeah, it really, the cross on the back talks about erasure and the cloak talks about pride and is sort of uh, Curry Shield patterns actually from um, southeastern Australia where I'm my mob's from. Um, okay, I think it's totemic for me. It's a totem that's found me. My um, tribal name is Narin or the Emu but the dingo has always been present in my work. This dingo is called Dingo Spirit. And um, again, it features Curry Shield designs on the back, but it's sort of an offering to the spirits. In lots of ways, uh, my story is one of dislocation as I was adopted out and I had to probably come to terms with my queerness before I came to terms with my connection to Narigo culture. So again, it gives me a unique perspective. Um, I don't see myself as, um, I see myself as part of living Aboriginal culture and a thread in the story of the community. And again, the dingo is a reference because it's actually got um, its authenticity in question as a uh, authentic native. And it's also in the, in that also in that role of native is um, often seen as the outsider to the other natives and doesn't have the level of protections that the other natives have got. So it, it all, it's also a reflection on our, our protections as queer people and our rights um, being less than the heterosexual community. So that's why I, I use the dingo. Warren, um, what role that culture plays in your work? Can you just repeat that question, Joe? Um, um, what role does culture play, play in your work? work. Can you elaborate um, on that? I, oh, I'm sorry, I'm struggling to hear that. I'm just going to talk a bit about that I work for a queer organisation as well. Um, and I, I'm, I work for Thorn Harbour Health, which is the largest LGBTI community in um, health organisation in Victoria. I work there as the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander project worker. Um, and that sort of duality of artist and community worker is really important to me. Um, culture is a massive play part of my um, work and 
I guess I'm fighting for my right to be visible in mainstream culture and to be visible in Aboriginal culture. And I think my artworks, you know, really informed by activism and activism in the culture to um, overcome the erasure of Aboriginal queer people as well. Yeah. All right, thank All right. you so much, Peter. Um, could you put your hands together for Peter? Well, what we'll do now is we'll just open it up to the audience uh, for questions, and that will include online audiences. What I'll, but I'll probably just start with a question for my, from myself, so just give you a couple of minutes to think about questions for you as well. Um, my question would be, we've talked about erasure and the absence of evidence. I would like to know why do we need to reclaim a queer history at all? And that will be, uh, I'll ask that question of all the panellists, and in terms of reclaiming a queer history, what challenges have you come across? I know, I know um, Jerry, for instance, has mentioned some of those challenges. challenges. I'd like you to perhaps elaborate on them a bit more. Perhaps, uh, Jerry, could you start? Um, can you hear me? Uh, well, I think that um, as a young lesbian artist, um, I went to Canberra to do my postgrad and. I was, I was very interested, interested in lesbian, lesbian artists. artists. And, and was, was there, there any? any? No. no. Not that no. I could see. And, and so, so I ended up doing my diploma on, on the French, French lesbians. So, so all the, the famous, famous lesbians, lesbians on the left bank, bank. which was which fabulous, was, right? But actually, actually trying to ground myself in Australia was a little bit more difficult. And um, so, so I, I, I then, then realised realize that, that I would I have to make that change in art, art history, I would I have would to start, start trying to find those people and present, present them, even, even you know, even you know, though even um, are, th that was pretty difficult. Pretty difficult. And, of and of course, there are lots of lesbian, lesbian artists, artists in Australia. Australia. Yeah. But then, but then, then I came back to Western Australia, Australia. Um, uh, it's, a it's a small community small here, community and we have, we have the added, added problem, problem of not being visible in the eastern states at all. But we do have some great lesbian and gay artists here and, you know, Andrew Nichols is up the back. There's quite a few people that have been around for a long time and doing this work for a long time and that's, that's been great, you know, but um, there hasn't really been enough work done on talking about our histories for younger queer artists coming forward. You know, some of the people in, that in Brent show they wouldn't have known about some of the people that are in the collection, for instance. You know, do they know about Doe Bell? Do they know about Gleason? Uh, do they know about Janet Cumbrae Stewart? I would say probably not. And so my work in the, that show was really critiquing the curatorial strategies in museums and art galleries that have kept this knowledge, you know, secret and quiet. And I'm not blaming them for that because it was done to protect the artist as much as it was done to protect the institutions. But what I'm saying is it's about time we stop being so conservative. You know, it's about time we're able to say the word queer and lesbian and gay and trans in our museums as easily as we say, I am a Wiridjuri artist or I am an artist from Western Australia or I'm a woman artist. You know, that's what I, my aim is, just to have that ease, that grace and ease of talking about sexuality in general. And that's my aim, you know, I guess. I think it's important for younger artists. Thank you. Why do we need to make the fame? You've mentioned archives. And, and how they might have a kind of limited view of, provide us with a limited view of history. What other challenges are there and why is claiming a queer history important? Mm. Starting with the latter part of that question, um, I think archives and histories are really powerful tools and sites for... Sorry, can you hear me? Yep. Um, so archives and histories are powerful tools, sites for reanimation and reframing and realigning histories. And so um, if we think about it in this kind of way, then it's a, it's a space of contestation. It's a place where we can um, challenge 
history and truth and power um, in ways that can recontextualize in particular in our space social histories which can challenge dominant ways of thinking do dominant modes of knowledge um, and hopefully for me ultimately um, advance the case for social change in the present and so for me you know challenging rethinking reframing these histories is a deeply political field of practice often with ideas of justice at its core um, ideas of moving towards social justice in terms of challenges it, that kind of level of invisibility um, and erasure that um, we've mentioned before um, make it really difficult to recuperate and to, to challenge those histories because um, what we might consider evidence is often lost and so how can we put together these histories in ways um, that that can be meaningful um, in a space where our histories have been largely lost or erased or hidden um, for a variety of reasons not the least of which is criminalization in terms of um, LGBTQ plus people um, in yeah so in terms of challenges it's that idea of finding these histories um, but also recontextualizing them in a way that um, makes them relevant and as artists I think the key there um, at least from my perspective and in, in my practice is about making it visceral so making it visible in a way that creates an encounter an experience so you're actually able to engage with these these histories in ways that um, might help us to rethink them I guess we'll just count thanks <laughs> thanks thanks Drew um, Peter so why do we need to reclaim a queer history and what are some of the challenges that you've come across I think I, as an Aboriginal person and given our um, history, a lot of people want to know, you know, I guess it's intersectionality that's really important in the contemporary as well. Um, and we're exploring that in our organisations and in art. I think I've really been interested in curating shows like Other Other where I've looked at um, the margins of the margins in the queer community and I'm really in a lot of ways have worked in um, really marginalised parts of the Aboriginal community as well, because I relate to that and um, uh, am part of that. Uh, I think we often get asked, what was it like before colonisation? And I think it's been really hard to track that down. You know, where do queer people fit in? And um, you have to look at who wrote our history and it wasn't us. So that's really telling. And I think sometimes I, I think that makes it complex, but I also think we have to think about how vibrant the Aboriginal LGBTIQ community is now and what a big part of um, being visible is really important. I think being visible and questioning, you know, we've had a Christian history, you know, which I'm not knocking Christian Christianity, but it's often been seen as quite a negative, um, had negative consequences for the queer community. So, um, the, all these processes, and we're put into missions. We're often under the the guise and um, being watched by, you know, religious organisations uh, and protectors. So um, I think it's been really hard to find some of that archive, and um, I think people, it's a continuing quest. Um, I can understand why it's been difficult, but I also try to think about being a role model and being um, very prominent as a, a queer person, a um, Narago person um, now, and that we need that to communicate to young people and to young queer Aboriginal artists and queer people as well, that it's okay and you can do it, you know? So I think that's... Yeah. Thanks, Peter. That was a really salient point about who gets to write history and how do we find our own histories when they might be lost in the archives or weren't, were erased. Um, okay, we'll just open it up to the audience now. Um, just a question down there and over here. Um, hi all, hi Peter and Joe and Drew. Um, this question is to Peter. I just want to know 
What is the most challenging thing that you found being a queer Aboriginal artist um, in your practice and, and life in general? I, look, I, I think it's been really, you talk about archives and history, it, it was actually really difficult for me as an adopted Aboriginal person or someone dislocated in the system to find my way home. And it's taken me a long journey and you know, thankfully I'm at peace with all that now, but I also have, am a, a man who's lived through the AIDS pandemic. So um, that was, when I was a young person, that, that was, yeah, it really was complex and homophobic and the reaction to that um, pandemic really changed the trajectory of my world in a lot of ways, you know, so um, and as I come back into the Aboriginal community, which I've got a unique perspective to do that as a queer, like probably working on queer stuff first, I found it really difficult. And, you know, um, I think it's been, um, it's gotten much easier and, you know, we've come such a long way. So I'm really thankful for that. Um, and that's on the backs of other Aboriginal queer mob who have done some of the hard lifting for me to be able to be in a space like this now. So. I think it's challenging, but there's also something beautiful about um, the communal way of living that we do and the sharing and caring that we we do. And I've been working a lot on um, with a couple of organisations on increasing the accessibility to the LGBTI community in the Aboriginal community control services. You know, um, there's a thing called the Rainbow Tick and we've been working with that shows. And, you know, I've been really uplifted because the Aboriginal Community Control Services really want to tackle some of this stuff, you know, talking about queer, trans people entering the services. And in the other way, as an Abor I'll just finish on this, that as an Aboriginal person, you know, I think our cultural being, being a cultural being is really important for us, you know, like um, in lots of ways, we, we'd like to go to services that meet our cultural need and sort of, um, as queer people, you know, I guess I want to be Narugu, but I want to be a queer Narugu person. I don't want to be anything less, you know, so yeah, I'll just say that. I think there was a question. Um, I hate to introduce text into this discussion. I really found tremendous parallels between, you know, listening to your discussion about artworks in visual sense. And um, I was particularly interested to hear from Michael Kirby because he did the introduction to my book on same-sex marriage in Australia, which is called Speak Now. And I gathered together as many people as I could to tell their story. Um, some of it was very academic, a lot of it was very personal, but it crossed the boundaries of gay and straight because there were parents complaining, there was one woman, for example, complaining that one of her daughters could happily get married and the other one couldn't marry her partner because they were lesbian, you know. And there were lots and lots of cross sections going on in this. And Michael launched this book at Glebe Books in Sydney and I launched his first memoir at the same time. And he told an extraordinary story about sitting in a lecture theatre on, in Pitt Street or somewhere when he was a young law student listening to the presentation of the laws against homosexuality and he had to just weather it and he survived and if I got a chance to talk to him I would remind him of that and call him your honour because to me he's done the most amazing living arc you know where his, his own life arc has been a statement and an evolution and an activism but in a very respectable and rational way. <laughs> um, and I did, a, I did a book myself. I've used, Soc Socrates is reported to have said, because you know he didn't write anything down, um, he's reported to have said that the unexamined life is not worth living. And I've found using biography and autobiography and memoir um, have not only given me a chance to reassess my life and recover my voice that was buried, you know, in the hostility that he was, I'm 75 now, it's taken quite a while, you know, but I am speaking up 
And one of those is my book called The Boy in the Yellow Dress, which is an autobiography about growing up as a sissy boy in Perth in the 1950s. And I also found that the thing that, the sort of root of homophobia seemed to come from religion, surprise, surprise. But, and I found that by going backwards, one can sometimes go forward. And I looked at a lot of ethnographic literature and records and reports about other cultures that weren't brought up under the sort of Judeo-Christian, um, you know, rubric. It irritates me now to hear young, um, I don't want to be too insulting, but you know, young ignorami, is there a plural of ignoramus? Thinking that they've got a whole bag of theology by saying, the Bible says, or they don't even mention the Bible, it's just sort of spread into the culture. Um, it's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, and they think that's the beginning and end of the discussion. But by looking at other... Can I just interrupt you for a minute there? Because yep. I think you are talking about the importance of text, yeah? Yep. And, and I'd like to say that that is incredibly important. The empirical evidence, yep. as Drew was saying, <laughs> is so important and so... And writing down our histories is a very important thing to do. These works are grounded also in activism and they yeah. sometimes mm -hmm. become very polemical. Yeah. I got my PhD at the age of 62 by writing a yeah. back against even the cult li literary culture. Yeah. And sorry, what, what's your question again? I think oh. I might have missed it. Yeah. Did I have to make a question? <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. questioning everything. And at 75 years old, I think I've got a right to do it. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, I'll shut up. Um, it would be it would be really interesting to look at your books. I'll, I'll I'll be very happy to look at your books later on because they sound really fascinating. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? Comments plus questions, short comments plus questions. <laughs> I do have one question. Um, so getting back to the written text, so uh, Joe, you have a very strong interest in the written text and obviously you do as well, Drew, because uh, you have images of, I think it's the diaries from the ship as well as transcript, I, I guess you'd call it transcriptions. Uh, um, could you, and I'm not sure about your work, Peter, if that includes text as well, but could, could Joe and Drew or Peter as well, could you talk about why the text is important in your work? Does Joe want to go first or? Okay. Okay. Um, so text and language are obviously critical to knowledge and meaning. And so that's kind of, you know, going back to the Foucauldian stuff, which I laid on you a bit earlier, for me, that's really critical to, to ideas around, you know, knowledge and power and social change. And so um, I do use text in my work, um, not, not all the time, but it does pop up frequently as a way to anchor particular types of meanings and particular ways of, of looking at at history and language. Um, but also, I mean, in, in a sorry for lack, in some ways it's also um, anchoring this history. It's the, the journals are the only source of um, this record um, from an empirical sense. Um, but then also interpreting the language and thinking through it um, becomes really relevant too. And to, to tie in with um, the comment the gentleman before was just making as well, there's an interesting relationship there between social context and history um, in the example um, he was giving in, in relation to religion, for example, you know, is it religion that um, led to queer oppression or is it actually a cultural context? Because, you know, we could argue at different points in history, um, those cultural contexts actually didn't require such stringent um, policing of sexualities and, and genders, for example, in certain ways, in others they may have. Um, but I think it's really interesting to think about these, these relationships and again, looking at them through language and interpretation 
really opens up space for dialogue, um, is what I would say. Um, I think I'd just say Lawrence Wilson at the moment. I've, I've, I've used particular text, and that's to play around with the idea of evidence, because, um, you know, I, we, we talked before about um, <laughs> some people perceiving that I'm outing these people. And so me as, a, as an individual, to, it's not my place to out people, but the actual thing is that if you don't know that they're gay, if you don't go into, you know, into the academic papers, if you don't, how do you find out that these people had a complex sexuality? Um, it's very hidden, and I guess um, it's hidden in, in curatorial, like curators historically know all of this stuff, all of the stuff that I've, I've talked about from these artists from 1900 to 1960. But they, the knowledge is going to die with them unless they start talking about it. And um, this, I, I actually, as part of the research that I did, I rang up um, a very famous um, historian, Daniel Thomas, who lives in Tasmania, who's in his 90s now. And I had a question to him about one of the um, women in the collection. And he was apparently the only person in Australia that could answer this question because they couldn't find it in a text. When I spoke to him about that I was making this list, an audit of gay and lesbian or queer artists in the Lawrence Wilson collection, he just said to me, oh, well, you've left out the two most famous ones. And um, he was actually quite keen for them to be on the list, which was a bit of a surprise to me. And that, of course, was Sidney Nolan and Ian Fairweather, who I would never have dared to say were queer unless he had said they were. And he, um, you know, but he has never written this down. So, you know, we, how are we supposed to know this in the future? And is it important? I mean, I, as a queer artist, think it is important. But obviously, curators don't necessarily have the same view. Um, that's all I've got to say about that. Peter? Um, I'll just say I subvert text. Um, I'm wearing one now. Always was, always will be Aboriginal queer mob. You know, that's a theme of NADOC. But, um, and I've often a cheeky little spirit. So yeah, I subvert text to use that. And I think what's coming next for me is that we're going to revive some of the Narigu language with my fellow Narigu people. And um, I think that's going to really change my practice going forward and um, embed me more in culture. It's where, you know, there's always that question when you're using um, Indigenous language, whether you have to put the English translation and um, what's is decolonizing just leaving the language as well and some of the works i've done that in as well so you know people have to work it out and um i think that's yeah i use language in challenging ways thanks um do we have any questions from the audience otherwise i will keep talking and asking questions yeah hi um i'm interested in uh I guess what are the what are the limitations in terms of applying our own cultural lenses to the mysteries of the past? There are ways that we conceive of gender and sexuality now, which of course have, have changed over the last 10 year, years, let alone the last 20, 30, 40. Um, obviously we come from particular cultural positions, particular, particular historical positions. Just kind of interested in how you navigate that unknowable diversity maybe when you when you visit the archive um, and how you how you manage your own lens it's a pretty open question but wants to um, I think it's not particularly helpful to give labels to people who may not have used them themselves or think of themselves in particular kinds of ways or having thought of themselves as having a particular identity. Um, but I think there's nothing wrong with speculating, positing and engaging in discourse around that. Um, I think we just need to historicize and contextualize where relevant, um, you know, to make sure that um, we're not overlaying our own kind of cultural context over a different context.
context. But I think what we do do in um, thinking about those things is also we're contextualizing it in the present for contemporary audiences, if that makes sense. So the work we make, artwork that we make, um, is being you know, encountered in the present moment. And so when we're making artwork about historical events, we're, we're talking to, to audiences in the present. Um, and so when we do kind of historicize things in ways that are relevant for those audiences, there may be those elements of, um, of speculating and, and questioning, but I think it's important that we don't overlay or, um, or, or label in ways that may not necessarily reflect historical um, evidence to go back to the word that Joe used. Um, and so it's kind of a delicate balance between, you know, those those different lines that we need to tread from, from my perspective. Delicate balance, but I also think that we need to be a hell of a lot braver because we are so conservative as a nation. We're just bloody conservative and we'll always take the conservative path. Oh, we better not say that, you know, these two women lived together and, you know, for 40 fucking years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we better not, we better not, you know, by default, Everybody is heterosexual and that pisses me off, you know. Why can't we be on the opposite, Drew, and say, no, I'm saying these two are lesbians and if you don't think they are, you prove it to me. <laughs> because, because that's what we cope with all the time. We live in a heterosexual conservative world where the default is that everyone's heterosexual until proven otherwise. And there's no possible way we can prove that in many, many experiences. But what I liked about your work, Drew, and what I like to do too, is that concentration on the body. Because the body is the way that people identify with experience. And, and by identifying with a, the experience of a, um, a, a different sexuality or just sexuality, people understand that we're all human and that breaks down difference for me. So, you know, seeing those, the, the beautiful skin of those two guys that you had I think they are just above me there. You know, the concentration on the body, I can never experience what a gay man is going to experience, but I can get an idea of it and the pleasure of it. You know, the pleasure of that touch. And that goes over time. You know, I think that goes way back. And so why can't we, you know, be braver with this stuff instead of being so careful all the time? Yeah. Um, that's the point of anyway. <laughs> I don't think you have to be respectful, you can't be disrespectful, but you can be a lot more open, I think, or give those, and, you know, we're talking about Aboriginal sexuality, Peter, I know that there's many anthropologists, you know, white European anthropologists, who've written about Aboriginal sexuality, and they've written it all in Latin, so not only does it have to be translated from Latin to English, it has to be translated with the help of Aboriginal people and traditional owners, because there's a whole lot of layers there that we don't understand, right? Is, do you, you, you agree with that, Peter? Yeah, I totally agree. I think it's, um, I really, the principle of Aboriginal culture is that you speak for your country, you know? So often even to find queer dreaming stories or um, to be able to retell them, you know, I've got to be very careful and culturally sensitive to the mobs who own those stories. And um, I think people forget that sometimes. Um, I try to even, yeah, I think, look, I agree, Joe, we need to be less conservative and more open. I mean, that's, yeah, I think what in my time, I've, yeah, I've come across communities where there are queer people living in more remote communities as well. And I've heard stories about stuff, but I'm not, I don't have the right to tell that story, actually. It's nice to be told that story. And in a way, it um, settles my spirit and to know that, yes, it's part of the culture. And because we've had big deniers who say it's not, you know, and um, yeah, and I've been part of a group that's fought back around that, you know, um, I won't mention any names, but there's a there's this narrative that queerness came with white culture to Aboriginal culture. Um, and we're always fighting against that. And it's really tiring. So um, we know that's not true, um, but the archives to us are really hard to dig deep. And, you know, they weren't written by us and they don't, they're not culturally contextualized. Um, 
yeah and things yeah we're we're now you know as well and we're here now and so in lots of ways like I said I can focus on that past if I want to or I can try to celebrate the vibrancy of the culture now and um, even it's a political act saying I'm a queer being you know so a lot of elders don't really like that term as well in the community but I, I just sort of I know younger people use queer all the time in the community, but um, yeah, anyway, I, I agree with you, Joe. It's really complex as well. And speaking of uh, queer bodies, I, I guess with the two boys, they conform to maybe the Greek ideal of youth and beauty, but then there are other queer bodies, both hu human and non-human, and and Joe, you have the image that I, that I really like of the mollusks. Um, but now that I'm vegan, I have to make do with dried apricots. Um, maybe, maybe that's, that's what we should do. <laughs> well, we can have this conversation later. Um, where was I talking about? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I would like if you could talk more about how bodies are queered or how queer bodies inform your own work. Uh, maybe we'll start with Peter and... Bodies in addition to the dingo as well. I, look, I, this, I often refer to the dingo as a kin creature. They, you know, that's our land and our relationship with animals and the creatures of the land and... Um, you know, during COVID, I've been doing cooperative frogs and dingoes, but I see them just as human. And I often, um, for a while, there was, you know, using masks and doing performances as a dingo or as animal form. And, you know, I think they're all really important um, part of the culture uh, we, that we relate to. And um, that's why I see the dingo as a, a queer emblem, you know, for me and a queer totem. So. Um, it is similar to me, you know, and these questions of authenticity of our, that continue to rain down on our people, you know, um, who's in and who's out. And um, I think it's really important. I think the cloak as well, you know, um, when I first exhibited that, it's actually 50 pelts big and it has a long train. It is like, uh, it was called Narigo Queen, that cloak. Um, and I think it, but when it was in the gallery, it looked like it was inhabited by a person wearing this amazing um, cloak. And when it was first exhibited, it looked quite, it was, yeah, the height was wrong, but you know, it needed a body in it and to be, to activate it as well, to activate it. So yeah, it's, I think that queer bodies are really important. And yeah, just in my time, just the change, you know, in the, queer community, um, identity. You know, I didn't have many choices as a young person. You know, I didn't have the language. You know, we've seen it all shift so um, quickly. And, you know, I have to learn as well as a queer person and what, you know, I've reclaimed queer, you know, which is really nice, you know, for me away from being called it as a negative thing. So, um, yeah. The racialized body and how certain bodies are seen as more kind of desirable than others. Um, but Drew, I was also thinking that you have the body of water as, as part of your artwork. Um, I, I don't know if you kind of link that in a way to human bodies or it's separate. Perhaps you could talk about that in more detail. The idea of implied bodies, perhaps. Yeah, I think um, stand-ins for bodies pop up in my practice regularly, but as do um, real bodies. And I think, um, going back to the comments you're making at the very start, the challenge that I find is around who has the authority or permission or um, ability to speak on behalf of which bodies as well. And I find that a real challenge in practice um, is whose stories we're empowered to tell. Interestingly, when um, I started working in, on the project um, at Lawrence Wilson Art Gallery, uh, there were some people in the Geraldton area who thought that I was telling uh, a local story, um, which as a someone from the East Coast, I had no right to tell, which is really interesting in itself, aside from questions of, you know, queer stories um, and 
intersectional stories. Whenever I've worked with people who come from a different cultural context to me, I've tried to work as collaboratively as possible, for example. So um, I've done residencies in, in Taiwan and in Tokyo, um, in Taipei and Tokyo. And for both of them worked really closely with um, the kind of queer subjects I was working with to encourage their voice to come through in, in the work, which is another challenge we we're talking before about, um, you know, uh, queering histories. It's also another question of representation of people in the present that, that become um, a challenge. But I think having bodies, either real bodies or, or kind of stand-ins for bodies is really powerful, um, as Joe mentioned, in terms of making these experiences visceral. It anchors it around a body. There's something we can relate to, um, you know, metaphorically and physically um, in the space when we're thinking about bodies or our relationship to um, bodies as well that I think is, is really powerful and, and tells a strong um, story that, that encourages empathy or, or some kind of relationship. So at Lawrence Wilson, is Colin's work, the work that you look at and you actually have to inhabit the body of a trans person that is going through that the chemical, the, the medical um, event. And that I think that's a very strong piece of artwork that because it, it makes you inhabit that space. Um, so yeah, that's, I think as much as we can to talk about other kind of bodies, but to your work, you're writing about the Doctor Who and the kind of intersectional bodies. Is that something you want to quickly talk about? I wasn't expecting to, but I, I suppose I could. We have a, a minute or so left. Um, I'll just very briefly say that I, I, I wrote a paper with a colleague, Marina Gerzic, a couple of years ago, and Marina was more the Doctor Who specialist, whereas I really just wanted to talk about yeah, queer bodies and interspecies romance. And <laughs> I just thought this was a good way to do it, just talk about you know, um, the, the l detective who is a lizard person and, and her wife. and. Um, and how I get, I don't know how bodies come into this, sorry, I've forgotten, but um, anyway, we've got one more minute, just, uh, interspecies, interspecies. yeah, um, interspecies, yeah, I, mean, I guess I like the taboo element, uh, and that it also stands in for queerness, that you have someone who's a lizard person of colour, and, and, and uh, upper class sounding, and then their, their wife who seems like, you know, more the servant, but is, of an equal relationship, but um, in terms of their bodies, I suppose, I, yeah, I just wanted to talk about how they... Um, well, one's a lizard. Yeah, I suppose, yeah. <laughs> but I, I guess that you don't really see them do much, but there was a kissing scene, and that was sort of like not a kissing scene, and... A anyway, I, I don't want to talk about myself, but uh, we have... Um, we should probably wrap it up there. So I'd like to just thank... Um, Peter, Drew and Joe for their time today and for their wonderful insights and we'll just have a 45 minute break and can we just thank them now? Thank you. Um, one other thing, online viewers, you'll be able to access a walkthrough of the gallery and I don't think you need to do anything, it'll just pop up on your screen and once we come back at 2pm we'll have the next panel which is on queer curating and that's chaired by Theo Constantino. Thank you.
Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to the Thinking Queerly Symposium. This is part two, post-lunch. Um, before I begin, I'd just like to acknowledge that we are meeting on Wajuk Nungabuja and pay my respects to the elders past, present and future and acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands um, from which our other speakers are beaming in from as well as any of the, um, the audience online. So um, just for a bit of a recap, this morning we had a fascinating keynote from the Honourable Michael Kirby to begin with and then we went on to um, a panel on history and social practice uh, chaired by Dr Duke Dow. Um, and our speakers spoke about uh, querying the archive, um, resisting erasure and working in the intersections of culture. So for our second panel, uh, we'll be hearing from Jose De Silva, Brent Harrison and Melissa McGrath and we're talking about queer curating um, and I'm Theo Costantino. So um, I'd just like to introduce Jose. Um, Jose De Silva is the director of the Uni University of New South Wales Galleries, Sydney. He previously contributed to an ambitious program of exhibitions and projects at the Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art, for more than a decade. He has been part of the curatoriums for the Asia-Pacific Asia Triennial of Contemporary Art, 2006 to 2018, and curated the major exhibitions Friendship as a Way of Life in 2020 with Kelly Dolly. Gemma Smith, Rhythm, Rhythm Sequence in 2019. David Lynch, Between Two Worlds in 2015. Earth and Elsewhere, 2013. And the forthcoming, The Colour Line, Archie Moore and W.E.B. Du Bois in 2021. Um, so, Jose, welcome. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. What are you gonna talk to us about today? I think you're gonna speak about the, um, the exhibition that's currently on at U UNSW Galleries. Uh, well, thanks for having me. And uh, I'd like to also acknowledge that uh, I'm speaking to you from within the gallery and that the gallery sits on the unceded land of the Bidjigal and Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from all nations uh, of this country. I'm also uh, speaking to you from within uh, the exhibition Friendship is a Way of Life. It's a project that I uh, curated with my colleague uh, Kelly Doyley that's just about to close. Uh, and it's a project that uh, looks at the idea of queer kinship and forms of being together. Uh, we're really interested in thinking about the uh, spaces, the communities and the networks that are shaped by uh, queer friends, uh, partners, uh, and collaborators, and that find uh, expression in contemporary visual and material culture. So what I wanted to do today is just share uh, a little bit about the framework uh, for that exhibition uh, as, a, an, as another example of thinking through uh, curatorial practice from a queer uh, subject position, and, uh, and to make some, I guess, general points about uh, what I think are some of the characteristics or endeavors of uh, queer exhibition making. So uh, the exhibition, it was conceived around uh, three um, ideas. Uh, the first of which is the idea of public uh, relations. Uh, and this idea is kind of twofold. It speaks to um, the public expression of sexual identity and intimacy. Uh, but it also speaks to strategic forms of communicating identities. And here you see a panel of the Australian AIDS Memorial Quilt by Gavin Kirkness uh, that serves as both a public record of the epidemic's impact on the leather community in Australia, but also is a collaborative memorial made by friends, lovers, and uh, admirers to the 100 plus people that are inscribed on its surface. Um, and here we see a work by uh, Elm Green and Dragset. Uh, it's a work called The Incidental Self, uh, and it functions a little bit like an expanded uh, family album, comprising hundreds of photographs that document uh, a life based on friendship and affinity uh, as opposed to family. So I guess uh, the first thing I would say is that perhaps we might uh, think about queer exhibition makings being engaged uh, always in the, uh, the political project of visibility. 
uh, and that they become a space to assert uh, queer desire and pleasure uh, and work through some of the uncomfortable realities uh, around uh, race and gender diversity within our communities. The second idea is the idea of living arrangements. Uh, and it speaks to the places and the approaches to living and being with chosen family. Um, and the imperative to kind of gather, socialize, cruise and uh, create space. So here we see uh, some photographs by Helen Grace that document the early days of Amazon Acres, uh, a, a remote community in northern New South Wales that emerged at a time when the women's and lesbian separatist movements were seeking to uh, reframe alternative social and uh, kinship structures. And here we see uh, an installation by the American artist Macon Reed called uh, Eulogy for the Dyke Bar uh, that revisits the legacy uh, and history of lesbian bars uh, by creating an environment where viewers can um, access uh, material on closed venues, uh, but that also becomes a literal bar for community events. Um, so I guess the other thing you might think about is uh, the way that queer exhibitions uh, are always um, uh, in the process of assembling or reenacting uh, queer histories uh, and that the archive plays a particular critical role uh, for artists and curators to recover otherwise um, absent or lost uh, queer histories. And the third idea is the idea of uh, intergenerational uh, kinship. Uh, and it's an idea that speaks to a kind of confluence of learning and sharing and support across generations, as well as the, um, the idea of aesthetic or um, subcultural traditions that reappear across time. Uh, and here we have uh, a set of t-shirts by uh, Shannon Michael Kane, uh, his bootleg t-shirts that appropriate uh, slogans, iconography, design, and uh, signifiers of uh, gay male culture. And here we have a work by Danny Marty called uh, Notes of Bob uh, that depicts the uh, intimate exchange between uh, the artist and a blind man uh, who finds uh, sexual gratification in the individual uh, pitch and tone of the male voice. Uh, so in this work, Danny documents the exchange with Bob uh, and in uh, exchange for that, he presents Bob with an archive of audio recordings uh, made with volunteers that he finds on uh, uh, grinder or scruff um, who perform for Bob in exchange for sex with the artist. So I guess the, uh, the final thing I would kind of add uh, about queer curatorial practice is the idea of um, care networks uh, as a kind of central feature of queer exhibitions that remind us of the forms of caring uh, for one another, whether that occurs uh, in a bar or in a commune or uh, in online spaces. And that in a way, uh, queer curatorial practice um, cultivates a kind of, uh, a kind of um, like an embodied kinship by framing opportunities for queer audiences to uh, see themselves uh, in the material that is assembled and performed uh, through the act of uh, exhibition making. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Jose. Um, I look forward to chatting with you more. We had a very nice chat on the phone uh, yesterday and discovered that opening things up for discussion probably won't be a problem. So um, <laughs> I look forward to chatting with you in, uh, after we've heard from our other panelists. So um, next up, I will throw to Brent Harrison. One moment. Um, Brent is an early career artist and curator based in Borloo, Perth, who graduated with a Bachelor of Arts Honours in Fine Art from Curtin University. He curated Here and Now 20, Perfectly Queer, um, at the Lawrence Wilson Art Gallery, which is uh, currently, currently showing. Um, and this is the first group exhibition to be held at an institution in WA in over 20 years that exclusively features the work of local queer artists. He participated in the Australia Council's professional development program as an exhibition attendant at the 2019 Venice Biennale and is currently an artist in resident at residence at the Perth Institute of Contemporary Arts. 
So I believe you are going to speak to us from the podium. Oh no, that's a bit later. Oh, yeah, oh. That, that's when I'm interested. All right, well, I just, I just made that more awkward than it needed to be. Um, I will throw to Brent. <laughs> um, thank you, Leo. Um, so, yeah, um, my name's Brent Harrison, and I'm the curator of um, Here and Now 20 Perfectly Queer, which is currently um, uh, being exhibited at Lawrence Wilson Art Gallery. Um, I guess the um, beginning of um, my research into um, this exhibition um, was first kind of in the archive at Pika, the Perth Inter Contemporary Art. Um, and during my kind of fosking around, I found um, an exhibition that was called um, Queer in the West that was created by Ricardo Peach in 1996. Um, so this exhibition looked at um, the um, decriminalization of Sodomy Act 1989 that um, the Honourable Michael Kirby was talking about before in his um, presentation. Um, but one, the exhibition was kind of, um, Based, the Queer in the West exhibition was kind of based off that. So um, they were particularly looking at um, critiquing this um, law and in particularly the line that was um, uh, promoting or encouraging homosexual behaviour. So um, I kind of found that to be really interesting because um, I'm in my like early mid-twenties and I wasn't really aware that of this history in Perth and how um, me, like as a practicing queer artist, like what um, I guess the privilege that I have in being able to make that work in this time and space. So um, what was really interesting to me was there was this relatively recent history where that potentially was um, quite dangerous or was um, frowned upon and things like that. So um, I kind of started looking at um, some other queer exhibitions that happened it, um, in Perth in the 90s. Um, they were mainly at Pika. Um, and this was at the time of when, um, of the um, AIDS crisis. So I guess when um, cultural institutions were um, particularly, um, I think like looking at wanting to uh, give artists that opportunity to um, respond to those themes, because it was um, quite um, a um, pivotal moment in queer history, I guess. Um, but I guess following on from the 90s, I um, had kind of looked and there wasn't really that much history in within the last 20 years or there weren't any um, exhibitions that kind of covered these themes, even though in 2002 there was the um, lesbian and gay law reform which kind of overturned the um, 1989 Act. So um, it was legal now, but there weren't really many of these exhibitions kind of um, besides um, the Gay Museum, which Joe was talking about before. So what I think I wanted to do with this exhibition was kind of use it as an opportunity to um, address that absence and kind of pose like a quest, oppose, because um, I don't think this is like, this like exhibition is kind of like blanket, like cover it all and then that's done. I think this is like a conversation that continually needs to be happening with, um, institutions like arts organisations and galleries and collections like across um, Australia. So um, yeah, through like the process of curating this exhibition it was really important for me to have um, uh, intergenerational dialogues throughout the exhibition. So particularly having like artists like um, Joe and like Andrew Nichols who were um, part of these people to exhibitions um, in the 90s and then having some um, more early career artists who um, kind of offer like a different perspective as well, which is also like completely valid. Um, and yeah, I can think of my leave with that. Right. Thank you, Brent. Um, thank you for making some of us feel quite old during that I'm, session. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're now gonna hear from Melissa McGrath. She's a curator, writer, and collaborator from Borlu Bujo Perth. She's worked in museums, galleries, artist-run and community arts organisations in Perth, Adelaide, Sydney, Italy and America, undertaking communication, education, installation, governance and curatorial roles, focusing on projects at the intersection of contemporary and community practice. She is presently curator at Mundaring and Midland Junction Art Centres and co-edits Semaphore, a platform for writing about art and culture from Western Australia. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Theo. Um, 
I'm just going to run you through a few projects that I've been involved with um, to give a bit of context maybe for how I respond to the discussion that's about to follow. Um, a huge part of my practice as um, a collaborator, um, which I think is a, a huge part of my curatorial practice, has been the participation and establishment of um, a number of artist-run initiatives. Um, most recently, Cool Change Contemporary, but other spaces of varying scales and um, presences. All of these projects have been undertaken with big groups of other people, which is something that I think is um, obviously very important to um, presenting culture and um, having you know interesting conversations about where we are at any point in time, but also a key kind of like reality in carving out spaces that sit outside of um, you know accepted, um, verified institutionally like um, ticked off um, <laughs> activities. So um, these are some pictures really dorky ones. I tried to find the most like Instagram heartwarming <laughs> um, examples from my uh, almost seven or eight years of volunteering in artist run spaces. Um, but I think something that's really important and that I feel like is um, connected to um, what we're discussing today in terms of like there being a methodology or something connected with queer curating um, is the idea maybe that these spaces are non-commercial, non-capitalist, they kind of respond to really specific needs in a community. They're often for a really small group of people or specific group of people um, at a certain time, a certain place and they're fleeting and they change and they mould whatever is necessary and then they disappear and reappear. Um, so it's also really important and I feel privileged to have been part of what is a very long history of artist run activity in Western Australia but generally in the arts um, as a creative pursuit. So building structures for a community, amassing resources, working collectively is really important to me. Next slide. Um, this project is uh, one that uh, and repeat, which was um, programmed alongside the Fremantle Print Award last year. Um, it was a kind of opening up, we used one of the smaller gallery spaces um, to um, uh, show um, five artists who work in and around printmaking um, in process. So they each sort of were in the gallery for a schedule of days and making new work alongside all of the beautiful finished, polished, verified, finished artworks that were down the hallway. Um, I've worked a, a lot with um, obviously like artists in residence in my, my paying jobs and um, also the youth arts work that I've done is really about um, developing capacity, um, connecting people with new networks. Um, so this project I feel like brings some of that to the fore. Um, not all of the artists who were involved in this project knew each other, some were at very different stages of their careers. Um, so there was some kind of like sharing and connecting there. Um, and also I think just the idea of accepting that things are in flux, that process is important, nothing is solid necessarily is like personally something that's important for my identity and maybe embracing um, complexity and flux is quite an important thing that I think we should all get more used to. <laughs> um, this is the first ever thing I ever curated. Um, high visibility, which I thought in 2014 was really about the mining industry, but actually was probably in the current context could be viewed in a different, <laughs> different way. Um, this was the City of Perth Ephemeral Art Commission um, where I worked with 10 artists to produce um, distributed multiple prints um, which every Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock we stood at the two main entrances to the Perth train station and distributed to the workers who were arriving in the city. Um, obviously connects with like printmaking as a really politically connected um, art form, um, the idea of distributing um, ideas um, and also being a little bit of an experiment. The artists 
all, all not necessarily printmakers, um, and they've all produced very different works. Some were really just, um, you know, about the formal elements of the print that were made. Others were connecting really specifically to the site where the print was distributed. Um, and we were kind of, importantly about this project, not speaking to an arts audience. This was not presented in a gallery. It was presented to pretty much as general public as you can get. Um, and even though all of the arts people that I knew at that time said that they would wake up at eight o'clock and get to the <laughs> train station, they didn't. <laughs> um, so um, I felt like that was maybe one of the successes of the project, that it was about um, kind of connecting with people who don't necessarily share my um, network or, or a specific arts intelligence and, and understanding how to have interesting conversations with people who don't know about printmaking or don't know about whatever. Don't want to take something for free, which is uh, interesting. Um, don't worry, I'm not saying too much more. Um, the last project that I wanted to talk about is Semaphore because it's what I'm doing right now. Um, and also when Brent asked me to speak on this panel, um, the idea of uh, the critique that Semaphore is publishing at the moment was mentioned. Um, I feel like critique is an inherently queer act. Um, we're constantly responding to um, frameworks or structures that maybe we don't exactly fit in or are not correct, are not um, accessible or equitable. Um, the other thing that's been mentioned a lot already today is the idea of an archive and um, the, the need to um, both respond to existing archives, but in this case, I think, uh, ensure that we are maintaining an archive. Um, a big sort of um, push for the writing and other kinds of responses that we publish on, on Semaphore um, is the idea of centering the subjectivity of the writer who, or the, the responder um, so that we're not just documenting the actions or the presentations that are taking place um, in the arts and culture in Perth, um, but also um, how it was received and the, the kind of specific responses that um, culture can elicit. Um, we've also, I just wanted to note, um, intentionally kind of uh, framed what our remit is around um, art from Western Australia as a provocation in a way to question what the state means. What are the boundaries of the state? Who enforces the idea of the state? Who does that benefit? Who does that not? Um, um, so that's just something that I want to mention as we um, think about different frameworks that do or don't work for um, particular specific human experiences. Um, yeah, one thing I also always mention when I'm talking about curating is probably my favourite quote about curating from Francesco Bonomi, um, who's an Italian curator. He's like, curator's not even a job, it's just something between an artist, a writer and a butler. Um, and I, I hold that with me really all of the time, mostly the, the butler bit, which might give you an idea of about what I speak to my therapist about a lot. But um, also, <laughs> the idea of being in, in servitude to something is, is, is um, a quality or an action that I think is actually quite important. Um, being part of a, a community or and, and whatever way you, you seek to define community I think is actually about holding your responsibility for people, your environment, the frameworks. I'm keeping using frameworks so, so well, there's my tick for today. Um, a responsibility to contribute, to keep ethics in your mind, to be, um, yeah, putting yourself into the picture and being responsible for, for whatever is being created and the future that we're creating. So um, that's me. Well, um, thanks, Melissa. There's so much kind of chunky themes in that um, very short presentation you gave. I, I'm reminded of the, you know, the meaning of, or the conventional meaning of Curation usually refers to caring for um, and, you know, being a custodian for, for culture. Um, 
is a really interesting way of thinking about that in relation to queer practice. And um, Jose mentioned this kind of ethics of, of care and relationality as um, being a, a concern for his exhibition. Uh, and we've, we've come up again um, in all of the conversations, I think, around the need for intergenerational communication between, um, within queer, queer communities and thinking about what, what is the, the legacy that you're leaving for the next generation? What can you tell them um, which can help them to make sense of their time and place to, um, to access a history which maybe has been made uh, less accessible to you? How can we, how can we um, open the archive for people that come later. Um, and you actually, uh, Melissa, said a, a phrase which was very similar to something that Jose said on the phone the other day, which was about embracing the mess. And I think that speaks a little bit to um, the diversity and, um, you know, points of difference within queer culture. And I wonder, um, Jose, would you like to comment a little bit more on um, that notion of difference and, and even opposition within you know, that, that queer is not a, a, a one, a single community. Um, sure. Uh, I guess, you know, we were talking yesterday about the, the Make and Read uh, installation, Eulogy for the Dyke Bar. And that was a project where um, we, you know, were a little bit worried that it might uh, be misunderstood or um, be a point of contention. Uh, I mean, the whole point of that project is to bring together different generations uh, to have a dialogue and to um, ask the question of, um, you know, how can we uh, learn from these spaces and move forward in creating new ones that are um, safe and inclusive? Uh, so, you know, it, was, it sort of was interesting to um, even have conversations with people about, um, you know, the term dyke and, and how in this context, it was being reclaimed in a really expansive way. Uh, so it was, um, you know, um, speaking to anyone who had an experience of um, feminine spectrum uh, queerness or who had any kind of affiliation with uh, or allyship with, um, with dyke culture. Um, so that was a, it was a really interesting project to, uh, as a case study for playing out um, those differences and to um, create a situation where you could have disagreements or, or, or you know, uh, work through that mess. Brilliant. Um, Brent, I wanted to just, I suppose, um, build on what you were, uh, what you were exploring and, you know, the, the richness of a title like Here and Now. What is it about um, being, working within a queer context in here and now, 2020, Perth, Western Australia. Um, where, are the, where are the challenges, where are the opportunities for, um, for working within this space? Yeah, I think it was really interesting because um, like when I like, invited to like curate this project, I had kind of, like yeah, not really seen like myself within like collections or within exhibitions. So it was quite exciting opportunity to be able to, and. Yeah, like I think to um, maybe to a certain extent, I was a bit like naive about some of the history that um, like of what has occurred and what has happened. So I think it was a really exciting like opportunity to um, be able to yeah kind of create these um, intergenerational dialogues that um, might not have existed before or might not have. Um, like, in, unless these works were put together, they might not have um, existed. Um, but I think as well, it's really important as well, like, especially with here and now, that like, I think like what I was saying before, that like, this is not a, um, this conversation is ongoing and like this still, cause as well, like curating like a queer exhibition in s some sense is a bit tokenistic as well. Like, and like how, and what does that look like um, in like, how are um, queer artists like incorporated or, or not incorporated, but I guess um, carefully curated into like um, other exhibitions and how, um, what does that add to um, that exhibition and things like that as well. So I think those are all um, definitely um, ongoing conversations and I don't, yeah, I think it's a starting. Mm. Um, Melissa, I, I was, 
kind of intrigued um, when you were talking about uh, the kind of remit of Semaphore and um, you know the the idea of the state and the local, and I wondered whether there was kind of like a, a querying of geography that um, is informing that in any way. But you know, you can just like put that aside if it's not relevant. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm kind of interested in how you. I mean, this sounds like a very job interview question. Like, how do you navigate the different um, stakeholders? I mean, you know, I was I was very interested by the idea of um, explicitly engaging a non arts audience. How do you navigate the, um, you know, your relationship with the institution, the artist, the public, within within a kind of queer working paradigm? How do you how do you wrestle with those things? Um, uh, <laughs> I think I don't know how to answer that question all at once. I'm talk yeah, no, I'm um, picket. Sorry. Um, so I, I think uh, personally. Um, I think the the role of kind of bringing an audience into a, a cultural experience is something that needs requires quite a lot of sensitivity, um, not in the specific context maybe of staging a queer exhibition, but I think the reality is that um, uh, contemporary art as a concept is something that sits quite separate to mainstream cultural experiences. Um, I feel like there's always a lot of conversations about. Um, uh, you know, a public that doesn't understand art, but sometimes I wonder if art doesn't understand its public sometimes as well. Um, I haven't really worked for an institution in the contemporary art world since for almost five years now. I've worked in uh, either independently um, in community arts organisations is where I currently work, youth arts organisations, arts education, um, a lot of the, the work that I do is um, providing a context for the practice of um, artists for people who do not have that language, who do not have that um, knowledge because they haven't gone to university, because they haven't um, you know, had people initiate them into what is quite a specific and niche um, you know, activity. Um, so. I think that care and awareness um, of the, the way that people are approaching any exhibition, performance, publication, um, strategically positioning things, providing scaffolding to support people's access to them um, is, is a big part of my job and a big responsibility as well because if you fuck it up, Oops. Um, like swearing in a public <laughs> <laughs> uh, thing, you, often you're done. People will be burnt by that experience or not want to re-engage with, with what you were trying to connect them with. Um, so, yeah, that kind of like ramp for an audience up to or into uh, a cultural experience is something that I, th I think... Um, the arts industry is still learning how to do in a, in a general sense. Um, stakeholders, other stakeholders. Oh no, that's fine. <laughs> okay, that's yeah, no, that's, that's great. Um, I wonder if, if Brent or Jose would like to build on anything that Melissa said in terms of, I guess, being that interface between the institution and the public and the, the responsibility of that, um, how, you, how you wrestle with it. Jose, do you have any, any responses to that? Uh, well, I'll say firstly, um, uh, I've been working as a curator for uh, 20 years and this is the first time I've had a chance to do a project like this. Uh, and it's only because uh, I'm, the, um, uh, I'm the director of this space. Uh, so uh, it's been a long time coming to be able to make a show like this. I did want to add, um, uh, uh, an, another point about engaging with um, um, the public and maybe to add to the Butler metaphor uh, of being in kind of service to the art or, or artists, um, I also believe that um, as a public institution we're in service to the public uh, and one of the great things that we can do is be um, part of, um, you know, educating the public but also um, valuing the knowledge that exists within the public. So, 
um, you know, one of the big aspects of our exhibition making here is our public programs. And we try and invite um, people from the community that have specialized knowledge uh, into the gallery to kind of share um, to share that uh, knowledge. And so the exhibition becomes uh, a vehicle for knowledge production and exchange uh, between the public um, and the institution. Brent, I don't know if you'd like to add anything or... I'm, I'm also interested if um, the panellists have any questions for each other. So do you, do you have anything that you'd like to add to that? Or um, any, anything you'd like to open up a bit more broadly? I think... Yeah, we had the, like, the idea of, like, of care we were just talking about, but I might flip it to, I feel like, caring about the artists, because, um, like, for me, this is my, like, first, like, curatorial, like, project, and um, for me, like, I would have, like, hated it if, like, any, like, would have, if any of the artists would have come away with, like, a horrible experience and, like, never wanted to, like, work with me again or, like, work within this subject matter, and I think, as well, like, um, when, like, being asked to like, curate this like queer exhibition as well, like these are obviously like really like personal themes that the artists are dealing with, and some of, some of the artists' work is like really like quite a lot more personal than others. Um, so I kind of felt like charged with making sure that like they were okay and like checking in on them as well because I feel like it could be like potentially a very confronting thing to kind of like bear your soul to. I mean, I guess all artists do that when. Um, exhibiting their work, but I guess when maybe this is kind of a site that is a bit more um, charged or there's like the potential for there to be like um, like an adverse reaction in the public space. So um, yeah, I think that was just something that was like I was really conscious of when um, yeah, doing this project. Really beautiful. And I think quite, quite a rare, um, I guess a I don't know if it's a rare consideration, but it's kind of, it's, it's an emerging conversation we're having around safety in terms of not only exhibitions, in terms of presenting them to the public, but um, also taking care of the artists. I think that's really beautiful. Um, did you guys have any questions for each other? Or shall I throw to the audience who might be itching to, to say something? Any questions for each other? Mm. Oh. Anybody from the audience want to pipe up? Joe. Sorry, Jose, can you hear me? Um, just wanted to know in your experience whether you've had any um, experience with a cancel culture. With, sorry, what culture? Cancel culture. With cancel culture? Uh, it, it, uh, personally, or the or the institution here. Well, whichever is relevant to you. Uh, uh, well, I mean, uh, we, we did think that we might have some uh, uh, turf wars with the uh, uh, with the dike bar, but um, that didn't happen. Um, I think um, uh, it's a really it's a really uh, it's a really tricky time that we're living in, and. Um, and, you know, I do feel like um, one of the few spaces that we have in, in society to grapple with ideas and to pull them apart and to argue and to work through the mess is uh, the gallery space. Um, and it is really difficult because there, um, there is an urge for um, institutions to take political positions and not be neutral. Um, and it's a, it's a kind of, a, it's, a, it's a balancing act because I think, uh, we have to um, be open to various um, sides of an argument and be able to stage things in ways that are respectful but enable debate to uh, occur. Um, so uh, thankfully, none of our exhibitions have been cancelled. Uh, um, but um, you know, it's something that we think about all the time. You know, how how will a public um, uh, receive the show, how will it be interpreted, um, and how can we help um, facilitate some kind of dialogue around um, difficult subjects? Um, I'll try and make this as 
concise and understandable. This is to everyone on the panel, but um, as someone who's sort of identifying and creating my own queer space, we're often told as emerging artists to branch out and not just to be insular in our work. Um, and so I was wondering as curators how you guys tackle this um, concept of remaining queer and safe and true to your own community, but then also having a yearning to um, interact with other communities like heterosexual communities or more um, normative communities because as someone who has um, straight friends and straight parents and everything like that, you want your work to be accessible to them but also true to your own community. Anyone want to jump in on that one? Yeah, sure. Right. Um, I think as long kind of as like, I don't know, like going through this whole like process, like I kind of think that like, this is maybe like really cheesy and really corny, but like as long as you're true to yourself, then kind of like everything will be all right. Like, um, yeah, I think it's like definitely like, um, like a big task, especially like, I know like when like talking about like this exhibition to my parents, I was very like, um, I don't know, I was like short sentences and like didn't really like skirt it around like the thing and like what was happening. So um, yeah, but I think it's as well like, um, I think maybe we have to give um, them the opportunity as well to be able to um, hear us as well. Because I think maybe we might be su quite surprised as to um, how understanding some other people might be um, about subjects like this. And especially as well, like, um, yeah, kind of like what Jose was saying before, like working with um, the, um, working within the, like the public space and like, um, like curating like exhibitions and being like mindful of who the audience is as well. I think it's really important. And um, yeah, there was a point, another point I was gonna say, but I kind of forgot it. Oh, I think, no, it was um, kind of um, something that I think I was told by someone that was, um, you should kind of like curate like an audience. Um, yeah, I think like kind of like curate like an exhibition with like an audience in mind, but also know that I think like, um, the audience is like a lot smarter than perhaps like you might think they are. And I think they're like willing to tackle um, these um, hard conversations and difficult questions that um, these like the artworks um, might provoke, which I think is a really exciting space. Um, I would agree with that. And also um, uh, when we're thinking about like points of difference, particularly when we're, we know that's being drawn on an, uh, a, in an identity space, um, it's really easy to see divisions between groups of people. Um, something that comes to mind is Sarah Ahmed's, um, the, of her kind of theory of the affinity of hammers, which is the idea that everyone's like, has a hammer that's like knocking against them, right? Um, it might not be the same hammer or the same part, the same challenge that you're all experiencing, but if you can find a way of, um, I suppose, like connecting <laughs> to this idea of a challenge or um, you can kind of bring people into your experience. It's not about understanding exactly or, or having an experience exactly the same, but um, maybe thinking about what is more common amongst us rather than what is separate. Um, and so, yeah. <laughs> a lot to talk about with communities. <laughs> Jose, do you have anything else you'd like to add to what's already been said? Uh, I would say um, sometimes um, you don't have to be uh, explicitly accommodating for a, for, for a public. I feel like um, part of the, the Part of what's really important about these kinds of projects is that we value our own history and culture and we present it as kind of truthfully or honestly as we can. Um, and there are some aspects of, um, you know, um, queer experience that uh, perhaps a, um, a straight audience isn't necessarily going to understand. So, you know, if we're talking about sex on premises venues or we're talking about, um, uh, you know, something quite specific, um, you know, there, there'll be certain limits of, of understanding. Um, but I also think that um, I was gonna say, uh, you know, what's been really great about this project as well is also being able to give 
uh, queer artists an opportunity to perhaps um, look at parts of their practice that they may not otherwise get to uh, look at. And, um, and that was particular with um, Helen Grace and those photographs of the um, Amazon Acres uh, commune. She's an artist who's known for her political work and her work that deals with like social housing and um, everything but um, her documentation of, um, of lesbian experience. Um, and so it was a, a joy to be able to um, provide a supportive environment for her to be able to go back into her archive and, and uh, pick out material that um, she hadn't felt comfortable um, showing before. Um, we have a question from online, which is tremendously exciting. Um, it's a question for Brent. Uh, online, anonymous online person asks, during your research on queer exhibitions in Perth during the 90s, did you discover the collective TWI that way inclined? Yeah, um, when, um, it was actually really funny because um, I think um, one of the, like yeah, throughout like, curating this exhibition, like I was um, also looking at like um, like exhibition catalogs that the state library might have um, from um, yeah past exhibitions that had happened before, and um, the only one that came up was a catalog by um, that way inclined for an exhibition that they had at Pika. I can't remember what year, um, but yeah, I guess for those people who don't know, and I'm I'm not really truly like properly familiar with them, but um, That Way Inclined was, I think, more of like a grassroots, like activist kind of um, arts organisation that was really, I think, um, quite inclusive and like wasn't just, um, I think, professional practising artists. It was more um, people who, um, like some people were practising and like professional artists, but I think others that may have just been like there for like community and stuff like that. So, um, and um, they had like, exhibitions at Pika and I think um, at the Undercroft Gallery at UWA, so, um, and um, in the Here and Now exhibition, um, kind of just next to the shop space, there's a vitrine that has um, one of the catalogues that we borrowed from the State Library um, in it, so, yeah. Um, any more questions from the audience? Um, maybe I can uh, ask, Jose, another question. I was intrigued um, in your bio that you're working on Du Bois. And I'm, you know, as, as we know, um, communities of colour have been pioneers in queer culture and the fight for recognition and equality. Um, is, is that a project that you're doing which has relevance to queer or is there something that you've, you've taken from working in that um, subject area that kind of in, inflects or influences your you're thinking about the intersections of um, sexuality, gender, and race, and, and all the other um, domains. Uh, it doesn't, uh, but um, uh, the, the material dealing with um, uh, Dubois is looking at um, experiences of African Americans post emancipation, um, uh, and it's, it's very much um, focused around class and race. And I do think actually one of the biggest challenges that we have. Certainly in Australia, I think um, some of the discourse in America and the UK is a lot more advanced, um, is being able to uh, really grapple with um, uh, the intersection of kind of like queer identity, First Nation identity and, um, and kind of, you know, race in this, in this country. Um, I will say that, you know, it was, um, it was a struggle to find um, um, some material for this particular show that would work with the uh, the things um, um, by uh, First Nation practitioners. Um, uh, and I think, yeah, that, that to me is one of the, the biggest challenges that we have both as a community, but also uh, in terms of uh, the kind of curatorial discourse around uh, queer art. Yeah, for sure. Um, maybe, maybe in closing, um, I guess it's, it's something that I asked earlier, but um, <coughs> I'd like to know, you know, if you've got like a little curator capsule, what do you want to leave for, for the next generation of queers? What, when you're a person who's attending a symposium and you hear somebody in 20 years talking about what life was like in the 2020s and you're like, oh, you're just making me feel old, <laughs> <laughs> young kids. Um, I don't know, what, how do you think about future generations of, of queer, if you do? 
Um, I think it would like maybe like be nice if, because um, I guess like we've been talking about like a lot today about the archive, but it's really interesting because like um, whilst the archive is such like a really rich and deep source, also um, it would maybe be nice if there didn't have to, the need to be an archive. Like we didn't have to go searching; the information was just already there. And I think probably in 20 years, um, the information like, of course, with the advent of the internet and blah, blah, blah. Like, I think um, the information will hopefully be there, and I think we'll be able to um, be in a better position to have maybe a lot more kind of, like, transparent conversations and um, be able to be really, um, yeah, I guess, like, um, just, like, respectful and sincere to um, other people's experiences and beliefs, yeah. Mm -hmm. Future queers. Queer futures. Um, I've been thinking a lot recently about um, a, a shift. I feel like is happening currently, and so maybe when we're in twenty years in the future, we'll be able to see it with a bit more clarity. And but I, I feel like at the moment, queer art, queer dialogue is is kind of maybe in the process of shifting from asserting a right to be in the room to maybe asking what the room does and, and telling more specific stories. I'm saying that with the caveat of like, I'm not saying that everything that happened in the past was simplistic, <laughs> um, but I feel like there's a greater interest or um, desire for um, really particular stories to be told rather than maybe um, having or being the, the fire for a mass movement. Um, jo said something earlier that I really connected with the idea that um, saying that someone has a particular identity becomes not a momentous statement and that would be such a bloody relief <laughs> that this element of our identities is part of what we're bringing to a conversation, but not maybe eclipsing all the entirety of what we are discussing. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. So that the future becomes more granular in its in its yeah. Um, Jose, any any thoughts about future generations? Uh, just the wish that um, uh, early career uh, curators uh, remain uh, and artists actually. Uh, remain invested in thinking about uh, queer histories. I think that, um, yes, so much, uh, a lot more will be kind of documented and available to us, but there's still uh, so much more that lives on in oral tradition or in ephemera that is gonna, you know, essentially be lost uh, to time. So I, and, and I think that um, the reason I say that is I still think there's so much that we can understand about the contemporary world um, and the resonances of history in the contemporary world by looking at this material, listening to these stories and, um, and trying to pull them apart. Um, and, you know, some of those histories aren't necessarily easy, you know, they kind of um, got problems, um, but there's lots still to be learned about how we can live uh, a life with intention by thinking about um, history. Beautiful note to end things on. So please join me in thanking our presenters today. Thank you for a really rich discussion as well. That was really interesting. Um, so, more than welcome, <laughs> pleasure. Um, so I think we are just going to pass over um, to Brent for the next, the next part of today's symposium. <coughs> Speaker, Dunya Ramandic. Dunya Ramandic is the acting curator of international art at the Art Gallery of Western Australia and has been a curator at AGWA since 2015. Her projects at the gallery include Space 3, North by South East, with International Art Space, WA Now shows with Evelyn Kotai, Tom Mueller, and Tila George. Um, she's also curating theatres and many collection changes, including I Want a Future That Lives Up to My Past. David McDiarmid and the Local Queer Stories, 
which opened today for Pride Fest 2020. Um, prior to Agua, she was the curator of collections at Devonport Regional Gallery, Tasmania, and has worked in a number of commercial and public galleries since graduating with a Master's in Art Curatorship in 2007. She was on the board of King's RE for over three years and curated projects including Forms of Deceit, Becoming a New Diaspora, and co-curated letters from the field at Atelier Kreuzberg in Berlin. She guest edited Art Monthly Australasia March 2020 edition and has published catalogue essays and chapters including for Australia, Antipodean Stories, at PAC Milan, My House is Too Small for a Residency Project, Next Wave's Views from Here, 19 Perspectives on Feminism, King's RE 10 Year Publication, co-authored co -author a chapter in Utopia. On, ah, sorry, in Utopian Slums, The Collingwood Years, as well as publishing reviews. She lives and works on Wajak Nunga Buja. Would you please join me in welcoming Dunya to the stage? Kaya all, thank you Ted, thank you Brent and Lawrence Wilson Art Gallery for inviting me to give this closing keynote for the symposium. Thank you all for persisting through today. I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Wajuk Noongar people, and acknowledge their culture and history previous to colonial invasion. I acknowledge their fights for existence, visibility, equality for their people and their culture since 1788. I thank them for, their, for the generosity and wisdom from which we can all learn. Their fight is not just theirs, it should be all of ours. While we listen to their stories and their song in Welcome to Country, we remember that sovereignty was never ceded. Nearly two years ago, I met up with a friend who was visiting Perth. He was researching an event that took place in 1727, arguably the first non-Aboriginal law used in and executed on the Australian soil. Importantly for Drew, it was related to a queer moment. Having Drew Pettifer's show, or um, show, A Sorrowful Act, alongside that of Bren Harrison's Here and Now, 20 Perfectly Queer, or Queer and Now, as I like to refer to it, um, has led me down the path of reflection. What does it mean to have an exhibition of queer art in 2020? I have many thoughts and will return to this question later, but first I'd like you to come with me on a nostalgic stroll down queer art memory lane. In 2020, I was still in high school. Dead set on nerdism, books, and not giving a toss about what was cool, I was going to study arts law and change the United Nations for the better. They were stuffing up so bad, they didn't even know they needed me, but I knew. Arts law at Melbourne Uni, here I come. I was also passionately into art. I painted, lugged my own chemicals to Melbourne Uni Darkroom to develop films and photos, and became fixated on the art of Africa and how it made European art better. At the time, I was also openly bi, though only at school, not at home. June 1999. My art class is off to an excursion. We're going to see something called the Biennale. English is my second language. I don't know what that is, but it's art, so I'm excited. We tram it, then walk up to a building. It looks like an office building, a bit closed off, and I'm even more intrigued. We enter, and along with adults who seem to know what they're doing, we move into an industrial-looking space, empty of office clutter, architecturally clean but rough. We walk through floor after floor of what I quickly understand is the art of now. Not the Picassos and not the work I saw by university lecturers in commercial galleries. This is what the artists of the now and all over the globe are making. So vivid was the sculpture of Robert Gover, the legs sticking out and the suitcase aqua aquarium, that my mind immediately understood this was about an idea, not the execution, about our deep and existential way of being. A snail suspended from the ceiling was moving a piece of mylar thinking it was making progress and going somewhere. This snail's thoughts and determination was the work. How wild, how pluralist, how inclusive that I, with no real understanding of the complexity of art, can understand this. Etched in my memory 
uh, Patricia Piccinini's video work of a jungle undercroft shown on many TV screens to simulate the real thing. And Ricky Swallow's little models of gallery spaces and other settings, which I remember disliking intensely and still do. Even at the time, I thought that if a girl made these, no one would swoon over them like this, let alone include them in this show. Wandering through, all proud that this was the place I felt comfortable in, to like, dislike, and have an opinion, even if it was only to myself, I came across it. I don't recall how long it passed, but I remember saying to myself, breathe or you will faint. Catherine Opie, portrait of Catherine, Melanie, and Sadie Rain. Its perfect triangular composition references Renaissance painting. Its stark afternoon light in a polluted city creates the Baroque yet oscuro, the dramatic light and dark. The subject, a family, a holy family, the holy queer family. Fixated on the child whose skin tone suggested it was both of theirs, the complexity of the sing signifiers, like this whole exhibition I was seeing, was somehow obvious to me. A white butch with an androgynous black woman, lovingly and comfortably connecting while looking at their child. Wait, who's the father? Doesn't matter. The community is the father. When do they get together? They probably broke up a thousand times and now they have a kid. These were my people. They weren't caricatures. They weren't mocked. They were them. They were happy. They hung on the walls in Melbourne at an important exhibition of international art on par with other important, recognised and coveted ways of being. Their moment was serious, important, uncompromising. Most importantly, it was art. Walking out of the exhibition, I needed to know who put this together and what was their job called? A curator, my teacher said. You're on your own, UN. I'm going to change the world by being a curator. <laughs> what I understood and experienced that day about excavating the present through art at the first and last Melbourne International Biennale, Signs of Life, curated by a lesbian curator, Juliana Emberg, has stayed with me. What it means to be in the moment, in the zeitgeist, to tap into the well of amazing ideas humans are capable of, to use them and create them. And I knew that to understand the present, one also needs to know the histories, because forgetting or being allowed to forget, or worse, being prevented from knowing, plays into the hands of those who, benef who benefit from our lack of knowledge. <laughs> As both French sociologist, not him, and theorist Michel Foucault said, and ACT UP, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, the seminal grassroots international activist organisation shouted, knowledge is power. But critical thinking and analysis are as much part of that equation as are facts. What I was referring to a moment ago was histories with a small H, not history with a capital H. Because we all know who writes that, and it is because of that history that there is still so much work to do in every sphere of our lives. Having the tools to analyse, question and counter what one is presented with and what the humanities are meant to teach us, but also what queer does best. My favourite text of late is Judith, or now Jack Helberstam's The Queer Art of Failure, in which she analyses popular culture as a queer alternative to the mo moment we find ourselves in, taking examples of Spongebob, Chicken Run, Finding Nemo and Little Miss Sunshine. His approach is akin to much of what has, has always interested me, even in 1999 at the Melbourne Biennale, and that is how to reduce hierarchies of knowledge to make tools for changing society for the better available to all. Quote, academics, activists, artists and cartoon characters, Helberstam says, have long been on a quest to articulate an alternative vision of love, life and labour and to put such vision into practice. A key way to do that is to reassess the technologies and mechanics of knowledge using what he refers to as low theory, what Fred Motten and Steph Stefan Ohani call the undercommons, what Nico Dox and Pascal Gielen call communism and Hart and Negri call multitude. 
shifting the focus from institutions like universities, which are inc increasingly disinterested in progressing the common good, teaching critical and analytical thinking, or widening and deepening the scope of nature of their inquiry. All these theorists and more speak of a new ontology of being in post-neoliberal society. Halberstam sums up nicely this alternative methodology in his introduction to queer art failure. I believe in low theory in popular places, in the small, the inconsequential, the anti-monumental, the micro, the irrelevant. I believe in making a difference by thinking little thoughts and sharing them widely. I seek to provoke, annoy, bother, irritate and amuse. I am chasing small projects, micropolitics, hunches, whims, fancies. All these are hallmarks of queer practice. All of these are on show, are perfectly queer, in the moments created by Joe, Joe Derbyshire, Nathan Beard, Lil Colgan and Bronte Jones. These moments are tiny motions towards something and at the same time leaps away from something else. So what, when, why, queer? Queer came to its current use in the 1990s both as a term of opposition and unification, but most importantly, expansion. Before we come to it, let's go a little further back into language's power. Foucault, who Drew already spoke about a little bit, established through a study of the genealogy of sexuality that the term homosexual was first coined in Europe in 1869-70 by a medical professional who sought to diagnose the condition associated with patients. Until then, a sexual act was just that, and people were prosecuted only for acts like sodomy, not for having a prolonged interest in the same sex. From 1870s, however, sexuality became acquainted with one subjectivity and identity, and terms homo and heterosexual became concepts proper. The 19th century obsession with sex, Foucault says, came from a sense that sex holds a key to self-understanding. At the time of eugenics, an increasing focus on hierarchies, so social order and race, the health of an individual and where they sat on the healthy, unhealthy spectrum became part of medical concern. Oh, I'm sorry, I should have changed that much earlier. Uh, became part of medical concern and of, as Foucault would say, technologies of normalisation. To categorise was to include and inc or exclude, to decide on a regime of normalisation or punishment. It was imperative that any deviance from the patriarchal system that was safekeeping the state and the social and political affairs did not derail it. It is not incidental that the term homosexual and its opposite came into being at the same time as the nation state. While Britain was an island already operating like a nation state, Uh, though not without its problems, Italy, Germany and others created single nations which were up until that point smaller territories, sometimes connected by the same language, sometimes not. Precisely the same time that we're speaking of. Standardisation of language, creation of new urban centres controlled with political focus, laws of property including those governing marriage and inheritance and civic bureaucracy were all features of the new system in each country. In Germany, the Biedermeier period defined a new urban style of family life. No longer living in villages and country estates, populations were now living in apartments and in them they had new chic beds, tables, pianos, they bought art and paraded their families down boulevards. The nuclear family produced offspring, ensured a seamless transition of capital through the family line, therefore ensuring interests could be secured across generations allowing for capital stability. For a working class, a family could guarantee to be a producer of a workforce. Industrialization, urban development, colonial expansion, the nation state, regulation of family life and categorization of homosexuality as a threat all happen at the same time. As the Gay and Lesbian Aboriginal Alliance said in Gay Perspectives Number no. 2, more essays in Australian gay culture from 1994, referenced by Jo Derbyshire in her 2003 Gay Museum exhibition, heterosexualization of modern society was a fundamental imperative of modern colonialism. 
Indeed so. The worry for the new colonial regime in Australia was that the invading population wouldn't increase enough to justify its presence, fight the local indigenous people and, most, and make most of its newfound riches. People were sent to Australia, people when sent to Australia, was, people sent to Australia for stealing bread weren't being punished for being poor. They were part of a plan of the colonial machine to populate someone else's land. Sin and morality were governed by the religious systems and infiltrated homes and private lives. A perfect machine came into being. Its birth was heralded by language, naming categories of inclusion and exclusion, belonging and normality, and of course, its opposite. Language is power, and the power is the name of the game. Queer was here to derail, to derail the binary that defined 130 years of normality. The term itself, meaning perverse or strange, had been used in reference to gay people since the beginning of 20th century, but it became a term embraced by the community in the 1990s, denying, bo denying both the oppressive categorization of the term homosexual and diverse politics of terms, um, and divisive politics of terms gay and lesbian that came in 1970s, they came with 1970s separatist politics, mainly led by feminist lesbians who at the time, at one extreme, questioned um, whether penetration can be called lesbian sex at all. Two things happened in the 80s to change the internal heated politics. The AIDS epidemic and post-structuralist reformation of identity, toyed with by postmodernism and manifested through do who you want, how you want, being who you want, individualism. Drag and s and culture and trans visibility helped too. Queer came to encapsulate pluralism of one's own identity, as well as the diversity of a community that defined itself as everything except heteronormative. Anna Marie Jagos, Judith Butler, Eve Kosofsky, Sedgwick and Jack Helberstam wrote well and astutely in an academic context about the parameters of queer, noting importantly that it is both a verb and a noun, a concept which by its very definition cannot be defined and thus holds a lot of power po for political change. Its very parameters are also intrinsically decolonial. For Anna Marie Jagos, I quote, queer is very much a cate category in process or formation. It is not simply that queer has yet to solidify and take on a more consistent profile, but rather that it is definitional in, but that its definitional intermediacy, its elasticity, is one of its constituent characteristics. She goes on to say that part of its semantic cloud, part of its political efficacy, depends on its resistance to definition, its resistance to fixing itself. Jago's approaches, uh, approaches to queer is to think of it as a zone of possibilities, a la Elderman, always inflected by a sense of potentiality that it cannot yet quite articulate. Queer for me is a set of parameters that always evade, like a good photograph or a perfect dialectic. You see the contradictions and they, and they are interplay, and just when you feel you've defined the form, everything slips away. It's a continuous becoming. As Nikki Sullivan has remarked, queer is not only about the makers of queer, but crucially about those who experience it, read it, engage with it. Drag culture, for instance, depends on this exchange and whether a performance of parody transgresses or reinforces hegemonic values or identities depends on how it is received. Where the transgression lies, where the resistance is, is with the context of its reception and the placement of the subject interpreting the act, with the audience, with the viewer. Reading some of those early queer theory texts now, one realises how far we've come. Discussions around BDSM, for instance, were key to queer theory discussions at the time, though does anyone reflect on them when they're tied up? And how we talk about transition, for instance, has become a lot more fluid. That is precisely what queer theory was trying to do, carve a smoother path for future queer. The 90s queer theory has equipped us to read our visual culture in clearer terms. So much of queer still rests with gender, and performing gender is hard work. 
The reason that the photographs of Catherine Opie and Della Grace Volcano are timeless and poignant is because they are precise in layering the performativity of gender with bod bodies that act it. The complexity of signifiers and rendering of those is both in a body that performs it and in the construction of the photograph. The intimacy that many have remarked between each photographer and the subject comes from mutual understanding of agency, of both simultaneously performing the querying of the platforms, of both simultaneously performing the querying of the platforms they occupy. The subject as the body and the photographer as the photo maker. As Halberstam notes about the work of both, they want gender to literally they want gender literally to be a surface for inscriptions, words and drawings, arts, art and desire. There being, there's being worlds where alternative masculinities make an art of gender. I won't go into the history of photography and the body, although that's a topic warranting an entire semester of lectures. Suffice to say that in ontological terms, in terms of the nature of photography, the index, the real thing in front of the camera, is already continuously performing against itself. The index is key to the work of Drew Pettifer in A Sorrowful Act. The index of the island in question, the diaries, ink on paper written by the hand of the people who share the air, water, food, space and time of the two men committing the wretched act of buggery, the attempted search for the descendants, flesh and blood of the condemned. These are not attempts to revive history, though they are somewhat that, but more importantly there are the aesthetics of history, the aesthetics of the index, the querying of history not in a didactic sense of recounting a timeline and finding gay people, but in the sense of grounding such a deep, such a find in deep time and deep space as it relates to us here and now. Shifting, if you like, the way we read this history, shifting the way that we read sea, island, punishment. Bobbing on the ocean, a moment of reenactment re perhaps, pre-act or post, we get a sense that we are simultaneously experiencing their moment then and our moment now, and that we've collectively been here before, and we have. Unlike the two men, we have a choice. A key point here is that queer art does not depend on the sexualization or genderization of the content of the work. What makes queer art queer is its strategy of disruption of our tradition, of our traditional, that is to say, heteronormative, neocolonial, classist, hierarchical ways of viewing so ingrained in our everyday approach that we don't even notice it. Our way of viewing, not, I stress, the artist's way of viewing or working. When I say traditional, I'm not referring to art pre a certain period or made by certain people. I'm referring to the viewer's positioning and the viewer's agency. So what does it mean to use the term queer when the acronym stack of LGBTIQA plus is expanding? What does it mean for us to view work by queer artists in 2020 in an exhibition held at a university gallery? How important is it to know, use actively and state sexuality of ident or identity of artists when displaying their work in institutions like the National Gallery of Australia or the Art Gallery of Western Australia, as Joe has mentioned? I will answer these in reverse order. Tade Britton sought to tell the story of queer artists from their collection a few years ago in an exhibition called Queer, Art, queer British Art 1861-1967, to 1967, a show that, I quote, explored connections between art and a wide range of sexualities and gender identities in a period of <coughs> dynamic change. While I know that for Tade Britton this was an important step in revisionism of their collection, there is a tinge of sadness that in 2017, that institution had to take the first step, recognition, a step that should have happened decades ago. In a more general sense, away from an exhibition such as this, categories tell a partial story and without a larger context for those who are not familiar with it, the category becomes a formality. 
If you don't know how to tell or read a queer story, you skip it. There could be another potential for invisibility. It is misunderstanding and invisibility all over again that we want to avoid. To my mind, queering the collection goes much deeper. As well as visibility, we need to build a context, a cascade of knowledge expansion, so that stories, complexities, layers, intersections are first of all told, then told better, and therefore understood. Our language needs to change. Our formats needs, need to shift. They need to shift queerly, not just on labels talking about the art of artists identifying as LGBTIQA+, but for all artists. Our approaches to curating, our methodologies, our, our practices of art and exhibition making, of writing and conveying need to transform. Queer is part of, queer is part of the decolon, decolonizing imperative that needs to take place now. What I mean is something quite different. Hanging works upside down is more like what I have in mind. For the 2008 Sydney Biennale, Gordon Bennett proposed to the Art Gallery of New South Wales a rehang of their collection, with Indigenous art at the centre of their main galleries. European art turned upside down. A not so radical proposal, but a radical gesture. Unfortunately, Bennett's proposal did not go ahead. Instead, he built a model of the proposed layout, which was acquired by a private collector and gifted to the gallery. I'm almost certain that the curators, probably contra to Joe's comment earlier, would have been in favour of realising his vision, even though I do not have this confirmed, because this is what curating is all about, shifting parameters of systems of knowledge and experiences. Bennett's radical decolonial gesture should have been a fait accompli. What happened in the gap between the proposal and the acquisition is precisely what institutionalisation is. Buildings containing art open to the masses to teach them culture, coinciding with the formation of the nation state and therefore with the building, sorry, buildings containing art open to masses to teach them culture, coincide with the formation of the nation state and therefore with the heteronormative technologies, that is, public museums and galleries. When we talk about an institutionalisation of art and what institutional critique was objecting to, we need to remember that architecture itself is not the problem. The problem is not that art is displayed in a large space with a lot of other art on white walls and spaces which may be architecturally intimidating. That sense of intimidation comes from the energy created in these spaces, not from the spaces themselves. I will elaborate. Michel Foucault, a realist rather than an optimist, has been one of my sources of positivity in 2020 and here he is having great fun with his boyfriend. He and I share a very important view. Architecture, he says, has no power over me. Not comparable to a doctor, a priest, a psychiatrist or a prison warden. It is only taken as an element of support to ensure certain allocation of people in space a canalisation of their circula circulation, interestingly in French canalisation and in my native language means sewerage pipe, um, as well as coding of their reciprocal relations. So it's not only considered as an element in space, but is especially thought of as a plunge into the field of social relations in which it brings about some specific effects. A key element can't be built into architecture, liberty. That is because liberty is a practice. Freedom can never be inherent in the structure of things because in his words, the guarantee of freedom is freedom. In essence, we matter more than the architecture. People are both the problem and they're also the solution. There's a lot of agency in being a visitor, an active reader and an astute participant. Like I mentioned earlier, drag is as much about the viewer as it is about the performer. At the risk of sounding like I'm defending the institution, I'd like to suggest that instead of thinking that the institution is impenetrable and therefore irrelevant and ignorable, let us try to see, to see it the other way around. The deep problem of institutional structure, the deep problems of institutional structure are only there because at some point they sounded like a good solution to a different problem. 
I offer a simple but to the point example. Research says that people in the gallery spend eight seconds reading one out of ten labels and however many remaining seconds looking at a work. Seconds. Anything longer is lost to them. To fit with that experience, we have 80 words in which to write about a work. 80. How do you write about plurality, elasticity, zones of possibility and becoming, the expanded perimeters of, perimeters of queer as a strategy in 80 words? Do you say the artist identifies as queer and uses queer strategy in their work and hope that people and hope that the visitor will inquire in their own time and eventually get to your point? In my mind, these are small problematics solvable by implementing a wider strategy, decolonizing and queering the museum at a structural level. It is significant to note that the genesis of Brent's perfectly queer show is an archive. An archive of exhibitions telling stories of a time when things were very different for the LGBTIQA plus community. The time that I also dwell into in the display opening today at Agua, focusing on the work of David McDermott and the local queer, queer stories. For both of us, history is important because nothing ever exists in a vacuum. As Brent says in his essay, the artists in this exhibition are part of a shared lineage that traces acts of queer resistance in the community. Through this historical legacy, these artists draw on the past and present, as well as their own lived experiences of queerness, to navigate through the world. The intergenerational dialogues, and I think this is quite important, and you alluded to this before, the intergenerational dialogues that transverse the artist's work offer insights into not only, that not only span time and memory, but also extend beyond age, gender, and sexuality. These artists have created artworks that reflect on what it means to be queer and utilize the work to dismantle the dominant heteronormative and gen genderist narratives to explore the significance of kinship and desire to offer a version of history that positions themselves at its center. Positioning at the center, but I have to insist that with all that I know that we need to dismantle the center. A white gay male functions in different set of power relations than a trans culturally and linguistically diverse woman, which is precisely why the multiplicity of voices extending out rather than in becomes imperative. We do not need to play their game in order to be taken seriously. We need to refuse the terms of engagement set up for us to fail. Queer theory was being penned at the precise moment Perth sisters of perpetual indulgence were holding vigils, singing their fabulously outrageous and funny carols and Connections was holding awards gala to galas to fundraise for AIDS, WA AIDS Council. Like the aesthetics of history that I mentioned in relation to Drew's work, so too this aesthetic is important and perfectly queer. Though, of course, it isn't just history, it's also cultures, genders and relationships to power. Just once, I would love to see how interrogating heteronormative systems, which of course every queer art show does, uh, how this can be done by heterosexual identifying people. I want them to know how their own privilege is created and sustained, what it feels like to live in an externally imposed construct and how far it reaches. While 2020 has been a hard year for everyone, the second half of 2017 was heartbreaking and a game changer for me. The five decade fight of LGBTIQA plus equality has been long and tiring one, a trauma passed through generations and sometimes, just sometimes, I would love to give to gift people a book titled A La Rainey Edo Lodge, Why I'm No Longer Talking to Hetero People About Gender. Allies are great, but just as is the case with fighting racism and neo-colonialism, the ones who keep that system of oppression alive and well need to work towards changing it. In the meantime, I will openly, uh, in the meantime, I will happily contend with the fact that the importance of a show like Perfectly Queer does not rest with the fact that it's in an institution like Lawrence Wilson 
or that David McDermott's work is collected by and showed by the NGV or AGWA, but that these voices have a platform and context and, con and a context given to them by people who know what they're talking about, people who have a lived experience of that way of being in the world. What we need is a breadth and depth, and my hope is that in 20 years' time, to answer your uh, question, Theo, which you didn't pose to me, but I already anticipated it, that's what queer does, we won't have a show titled Queer. That queer, with all its facets, will be the norm. While the Tate show came too late and Bennett's too early, clearly too soon, I hope that the next few years we will see major shifts in the way our society interprets power and agency. These have already begun and we will need to do more. The queer community has, the queer community has already developed a model in which it can be used and embraced. In 1999, my politics was very much detached from my personal experience. I didn't want to be defined as a woman any more than as queer or a migrant. Buying into those categories would limit me and I, th I now was brought up thinking that my brain mattered the most. It didn't take long with lectures on feminism, queer theory, structuralism and postmodernism at university to make me realise that that strategy would have worked fine, ironically, in my home country, but not in a capitalist, neoliberal, colonial and drunk on fantasy West in which I now found myself. While I didn't fit in my... In, while I didn't fit in with my diaspora, I fit perfectly on the dance floor at Queer and Alternative at the Builders Arms Hotel in Working Class Fitzroy. And while dancing there week after week, I realised that as much as I wanted to resist the victimisation that can come by being categorised as a minority that was lacking in some way, ignoring it was just as politically dangerous. Self-imposed invisibility, versus visibility was precisely the genesis of the queer community. If I can't dance, I don't want to be part of your revolution is a quote by early 20th century anarchist, political activist and writer, Emma Goldman. In the name of a performance project I've been drawn to um, over the years. It sums up perfectly the queer I've been talking about and my general approach to curating and life. Using the spaces we have and creating new ones, let us set our own music for a more equitable and just way of being in the world. And let's keep telling the queer stories any way we can. When things get hard in the arts, I still sometimes fantasise about the UN. But then I remember that the real and important fights are at the crossroads, sometimes one-on-one, -on -one, through meaningful connections by little things, annoyances, micropolitics, fancies and feelings of the heart. Queer equals power. Thank you. Use this one, right. Wow, that was fantastic, where are you, Dunya? That was amazing. In fact, it's been amazing all day. And one of, the, of, of very many wonderful images that have come through today, one that, that is stuck with me is when Michael Kirby said that when he saw the rainbow flag and he came into UWA, he felt welcome. And I just want to thank all of the artists, I particularly want to thank Brent and Drew, if you're listening, wherever you are, Drew, for helping us raise the flag at the Lawrence Wilson of welcome. I think this is in our 30th year, this is a very appropriate time. I hope we've done it before. I know that Joe's been putting up the flag for a long time, Andrew and, 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 and Colin and Nathan and all the artists here, but particularly those who are involved in the current exhibitions. I want to thank you for helping us do that. In this, on this particular occasion. I also want to thank, though, in particular, the speakers who have spoken today. I think, actually, Theo and Duke. Where's Duke? There. <laughs> Amazing job. That is one of the toughest jobs. 
being the chair of one of those panels, and you both did it superbly well. Our keynote speakers, both of them absolutely fantastic, and all of our participants, just amazing. These things would never happen without the work of the technical team, and gosh, you guys have done an amazing job. Fought against all of the technical bugs it, one could imagine. Uh, Nick and May and your team, thank you so much for, and KiteCast, for what you've done. Um, within a team, obviously, there's a lot of people to thank, but the extraordinary Megan Hyde and the unbelievable Pia Leach, who have really done so much work to make this together. I just want to thank you so much, just fantastic. Um, and I, anybody else? Oh, I wanted to just mention, of course, for our audience, that we are just about to go over to the Lawrence Wilson to launch two books, Brent's Perfectly Queer and A Sorrowful Act by, um, by Drew. So you'll be coming over, they will be available for sale. Um, and I would just like to end by saying, Thank you to all of you, and thank you to, of course, all the original owners of the lands on which we've met today, the Aboriginal custodians of all of the land across the country uh, where our speakers have spoken. It's always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Thank you very much.